Chapter 30 Yasna, 7 With the duels finished and the awards bestowed, there was little for the men to do but drink. As the hour grew late, the feast hall slowly drained of participants, the feasters trickling off to the sitting rooms. Those who remained in the main hall were subdued, their drunkenness leading to stupor and lethargy. Yasna's table, or rather, the queen's table, was mostly empty. The women sat in clandestine conferences, their seating rearranged now that formality had broken down. Many of the less important women had retired, and many of the more important had moved to more suitable locations for evening conferences. On the next day there would be further feasting and dueling, but the main events had already occurred. Those men who had important duties could be on their way, though, from the looks of many, it would be well into mid-afternoon before they considered leaving. Seven hours of duels, interspersed by the near catastrophe with the madman Taln and her frustration at Shinri's disappearance, had provided Yasna with little insight into her problems. There were only three ways to break the forced betrothal. The first required Elokar's permission, which was unlikely. The second was to join the monastery. The Order of Chonra accepted women. The third was to have Meridas's mother forbid the union. Neither prospect looked very appealing. Joining the monastery would require Yasna to forsake all political aspirations and worldly possessions, not to mention require her to join the service of a religion she did not endorse. The second was highly unlikely. Through the marriage, Meridas's family would secure ties to the royal Kolin line. Even if Yasna were to engage in some extreme scandal, such as taking an illicit lover, she doubted Meridas's kin would renounce the union. Besides, even if Yasna were to persuade them to break the engagement, Nanava would still have her right of decision. There would be many an aspiring lord willing to marry the king's sister, no matter how unappealing Yasna made the union. Even if Yasna put her displeasure with Meridas aside for the moment, she found herself frustrated. The queen's maneuvers made very little political sense. Why would Nanava marry Yasna to such a powerful man? Why manipulate Elokar into renouncing Jezenrosh? It made no sense. Perhaps Nanava had heard about the assassins. That could be a valid reason for removing Jezenrosh from his position, thereby weakening the man's claim to the throne. It was a move Yasna herself might have considered, had she been in Nanava's place. Could the moves be nothing more than spousal duty? Why then did Yasna feel so strongly that she was missing something? Yasna shook her head rising to retreat from the eleventh hall. Nelshenden stood by the wall, waiting dutifully as always. His loyalty to Shenares was unwavering. The way of kings spoke disapprovingly of any excess, including drunkenness, and it would take a royal edict to get Nelshenden to have more than a single glass of wine at an evening feast. As she stepped out of the room, a familiar figure appeared in the hallway, making his way toward the eleventh hall. Kemnar was not dressed like a nobleman. His cloak was of rough shenna with no dyes, his clothing a simple vest smock tied over a pair of ragged trousers. His eyes glistened with urgency. You found something? Yasna said eagerly, pulling the man aside as he joined them in the outside hallway. The assassins are here, Kemnar replied, pulling out a purse. In the city. I had to use nearly every gem you gave me to figure out where. He gave the purse to Nel Shenden, who handled all of Yasna's finances. The two soldiers knew better than to try and hand her gemstones, even currency. That was it, then. Balinmar was right. Ralmaha was wrong. Where are they? Yasna demanded. They're posing as a merchant company. Kemnar explained. You know when they plan to strike? Yasna asked hopefully. 
Kemnar shook his head. This is a clever group, my lady, very professional, very well established. They don't make mistakes, and even the most important crime lords know not to ask too many questions. Yasna folded her arms, tapping her foot in frustration. What's the name of their merchant front? The Chanal Group, out of Palinar, Kemnar replied. Yasna froze. She'd heard that name before. She thought back, trying to clear the muddled events of two months of intrigue. Chanal. Her eyes widened in surprise. That was the name of the company in the treasury logs, the one Nanava had been purchasing emeralds from. An irregularly large number of emeralds at an irregularly high price. By the winds, Yasna whispered. Now, Shendon, gather my guards and as many of the royal guard as you can persuade to come with you. Now, Shendon frowned. Now, my lady? Yasna paused. You're betrothed now, she thought to herself. The next few days will be filled with marriage preparations. Elokar will never believe your allegations, not without proof, and you won't be in a position to go out on your own. Move now, or not at all. Yes, she said. Immediately. The queen wants my brother dead, Yasna said in a hushed tone. Kemnor and Nelshendon sat across from her, in the hand-drawn carriage. The streets were empty enough this late at night to allow for such a bulky vehicle. They'd gathered about thirty soldiers, including her own, and the group marched alongside the vehicle. Hopefully it would be enough. That's a dangerous claim, my lady, Nelshendon said solemnly, his face shadowed in the dark carriage. The emerald purchases weren't meant to drive up the market, Yasna explained. They were a payoff, a way for Nanava to transfer a large amount of money to the assassins without drawing attention to herself and without having to delve into her own pockets. Ironically, my brother funded his own assassination. But why, my lady? Nelshendon said, shaking his head. She has power, she has rank, and she has the king's ear. Killing him accomplishes nothing, unless she wishes another to take his place. Yasna said, a lover no one, not even women of court, has discovered. Who? Nelshendon asked with a frown. Meridas, Yasna said. Kemnar frowned. That's a stretch, my lady. Is it? Yasna asked. He's now a Parshan and betrothed to the king's sister. That's not a large step away from the throne. Kemnar sat thoughtfully for a moment. Not a stretch to believe, he finally admitted. But a stretch to prove. We have had no hint of an affair. We'll find one tonight, Yasna said. Kemnar looked appreciative. Assuming you're right, they'd have to get rid of you after they kill the king. They'll probably wait a short time, a year or so. With you out of the way, Nanava and Meridas could make their union official. My lady. Nelshendon said. We should not be acting on this alone. I repeat my objection from before. We should bring your concerns to the king. It is the proper way. That's very honorable of you, Nelshendon, Yasna replied. But you just pointed out that Nanava has the king's ear. What proof do I have? Some figures in a ledger? Speculation? We need more. Now Shandon did not look satisfied. You should not have come, my lady. You know me better than that, now, Shandon, she replied. Don't worry. I'll remain in the carriage until the assault is finished. Yes, now Shandon said, as the carriage pulled to a stop. But we'll have to leave men behind to protect you. He and Kemnar hopped out of the vehicle, landing quietly on the street. Yasna had given orders to stop a block from the Chanal Guildhouse. As her men made their preparations, a stern face approached her carriage window. Lord Zanach, second captain of her brother's personal guard, 
was an aging man she couldn't remember ever having seen smile. His reputation for sobriety was legendary. Only Nell Shendon could have convinced him to agree to such a clandestine operation. His eyes, however, warned that he would go no farther without good cause. We're here, my lady, he said in an even but unyielding voice. Now you will tell me what this is about. There is a group of assassins posing as merchants in that building, Captain, Yasna explained. They have a contract on the king. This is about Lord Jezenrosh, the captain asked, eyeing the dark building. You've heard about that? Yasna asked. Zenach looked back at her. Yes. You take the threat seriously. It is my duty to take all threats seriously, the man replied. He strode away to confer with Nell Shendon and Kemnar. A few moments later, Kemnar and four men retreated to the carriage, surrounding it, Yasna, and the four pullers in a loose circle. The other twenty-five men drew their weapons and approached the building, splitting into three groups. Overhead, the stars sat in stoic regard. Most of them concentrated in an enormous cluster the monks called the dwelling. They gave little light this day. The dwelling was low on the horizon, and Yasna quickly lost sight of her men in the darkness. Then all was still. Seconds passed as heartbeats, then gathered into minutes which pulled on her nerves like weights on a string. Finally, a group of three men returned from the building. One was Nell Shendon. Yasna didn't wait. She climbed from the carriage and approached him with a rushed step. The guild house was empty, the guard said. They cleaned out, taking all of their gear. Only one watchman stayed behind. You captured him? Yasna asked hopefully. Barely, Nell Shendon said. He had a trapdoor out the back. Zanach caught him. Take me to him. Yasna ordered. I don't know anything, the man exclaimed. I'm just a scratch. What's a scratch? Yasna asked, turning toward Kemnor. A local man, Kemnor explained, hired from outside the organization to provide experience in the region. Yasna nodded. Two lanterns showed that Nel Shendon had been right. The building was empty. The rooms had been stripped of all ornamentation and personal effects, leaving behind only a few tables and chairs, one of which held the prisoner. He was a wiry, nondescript man, and his nervousness seemed a little too exaggerated. Kemnar approached the assassin, leaning down with a threatening look. Yasna watched with folded arms, Nelshenden and Zanach standing beside her. The room's only other occupants were the two lantern-bearing soldiers. You do know something, Kemnar said, drawing his knife. The well-made steel, created from an awakened alloy to be stronger than regular metals, glistened in the lantern light. It was a stabbing weapon designed to get through the faceplate of a shard-bearer. I swear by the tenth name of the Almighty, the assassin whispered, cowering. They didn't tell me anything. Kemnar leaned down closer, putting the tip of the weapon against the man's neck. I realize this isn't a group one betrays lightly, Kemnar whispered. But they're not here. I am. The point of the weapon drew blood. Kemnar, Nelshenden said. You are not to hurt him. Kemnar sighed, standing and shooting a dry look at Nelshenden. He stepped back to Yasna, speaking in a quiet voice. He is going to make this very difficult, my lady. We must follow Shenaraz, Nelshenden said. We have nothing if we have not honor. Nelshenden, Yasna said. This assassin has knowledge that might save our king's life. Better we risk the king than betray our souls, my lady, Nelshenden said. The words were not spoken lightly. His eyes bore a weight of decision. If we follow what is right, 
The Almighty will see us to victory. The Almighty, Yasna thought. Wonderful. Kemnar turned, eyeing the prisoner. He's no simple scratch, Kemnar said. He puts on a good show, but a group like this wouldn't hire someone they didn't think was trustworthy and able to withstand a little torture. I can probably break him, but it will take time, maybe days. Kemnar paused, eyeing the captive, then turned back. The thing is, my lady, we might not have days. There are only two reasons the assassins would have abandoned this building. Either they thought they'd been discovered, or the assassination is planned for tonight. You think they would attack the king in the middle of a dueling competition? Nelshendon asked, skeptically. Do you have any idea how many shard bearers there are in the palace right now? Blades and plate don't protect against a knife in bed, Nelshendon, Kemnar said. Besides, half the palace has drunk themselves silly. I doubt most of those shard bearers even remember their own names right now. Zenach swore quietly, breaking his silence. He's right, my lady, he said. Those palace guards who weren't on duty participated in the duels. And with all the shard bearers around, we let a good number of them off. We're as understaffed as you'll ever find us. Then we have to assume that the king is in danger, Yasna said. Captain, take your men and mine and return to the palace as quickly as possible. I want you to gather every guard and shard bearer you can to protect the king. My captains and I will stay here and see what we can gather from the captive. We'll join you if we discover anything. Zenach's only response was a curt nod. His two men put down the lanterns, and all three were out the door in a matter of seconds. Yasna remained, Kemnar and Nelshendon beside her, regarding the captive. Kemnar was right. They didn't have days to wait. They may not even have minutes. There was a way. The thought entered Yasna's head idly, then refused to leave. She could place a stress upon this man's soul that no simple physical torture could equal. No, Yasna thought. I will find another way. But what? Even if she persuaded Nelshendon to let the torture progress, it was unlikely they would discover any information in time. She could make him break. There was one thing every Rosharan feared more than threats, more than pain. She resisted the option, but it would not depart her mind. She kept thinking of Elokar, a man who was, to her, little more than a boy trying so hard to be king. What was more important? His life? Her soul? Now, Shandon, Yasna said quietly, holding out her hand. Give me a gemstone. My lady? Now, Shandon asked with surprise. Do it she said. The soldier quietly pulled open his money pouch, selecting a gem and placing it in her hand. The ruby was covered with a light glass glaze and stamped with the seal of Alethkar, declaring it to be worth fifty ishmarks. As soon as the stone touched her hand, Yasna could hear its tone. The note sounded powerfully in her ears, even through the glass. Could she do it? What would Kemnar and Nelshendon think if they knew? Like monks, awakeners were required to forsake wealth and privilege. But unlike monks, awakeners were also ostracized, removed from their families, feared, shut away. They were strange, inhuman creatures. Their arts changed them. People whispered that awakening didn't just change them. It stole their souls. It took from them their humanity. Yasna closed her eyes and held up the ruby. If she concentrated, she could hear another sound coming from within her, her soul tone. Unlike the ruby, her soul tone didn't give off a simple note. It produced a brilliant vibrating chord. It was her own unique harmonic, usually so quiet she couldn't hear it. She reached out with her soul tone 
the familiar chord growing louder somehow, though she knew she didn't hear it with her physical ears. She took the soul tone and touched it against the ruby, stroking its tone like a finger upon the strings of an instrument. Her soul tone gave strength to the ruby's music, amplifying it, making its pure, solitary note grow in force and strength. The ruby shivered in her hand. It began to vibrate with a soft hum that would be audible even to non-awakener ears. She heard Nelshendon gasp. She opened her eyes as the vibrating gemstone shattered its glass glazing. The gem began to glow with a pure red light, rising into the air above her hand, illuminating the room with a faceted Rubicon glow. The prisoner watched mutely, eyes widening. Then he screamed, struggled against his bonds, pulling ineffectually against the ropes, tying his arms and legs to the chair. Gone was his false anxiety and overdone cowering. Speak, Yasna ordered, holding her hand forward, the gemstone vibrating and spinning above it. I know nothing, the man screamed. Yasna turned her hand to the side, palm facing toward the far wall, the ruby spinning and glowing before it. She nudged the ruby with a stroke of her mind, flipping it through the air toward the room's lone table. The gemstone struck the wooden table, shattering into a shower of red dust, transferring its vibration to the wood itself. The strike sounded loudly, like a sharp pop within Yasna's mind. She grabbed a hold of the table's tone, a chord far less complex than that of a living creature. Normally, non-gems had tones far too weak to notice, but the ruby's explosion brought the table's tone to life, like a bell suddenly struck by an iron rod. Yasna held tightly to the table's tone, which vibrated irregularly, its own tone struggling against that of the ruby. If she did nothing, the table would cast off the ruby's tone, returning to its natural state. However, Yasna refused to let that happen. She pushed, hearing and remembering the ruby's tone in her mind, forcing the table's tone to change, to become a uniform note instead of a chord. It had been years since she had awakened, and her abilities were weak. She strained against the table's tone, the departed ruby's note, hanging and vibrating in her mind. For a moment, she could see beyond the table's form. She glimpsed past sight, feeling the table's pure substance, the lahel from which all things were created. The lahel of the table pushed against her. She pushed back, forcing its tone to change and match that of the ruby. The wood became fire. It didn't burn like a blaze started from logs, but was immediately remade into flame. The table exploded with a large roaring sound, a blossom of fire illuminating the room, throwing heat against Yasna's face, scarring the stone walls with black soot. Then the flame was gone. She could hear Nelshendon whispering a prayer to the Almighty. The prisoner was crying. Yasna's soul cord vibrated erratically, sending a shiver of pain through her body. The force with which she had pushed against the table returned upon her, and for a brief moment, her own tone threatened to change and become like that of the ruby. Yasna had to seize her tone quickly, holding it stable, forcing it back toward regularity. She took a few deep breaths. Now, Shendon, she finally said, another gemstone. A ruby, if you have one. Nelshendon was lethargic, but he eventually complied, pulling out another 50 Ishmark gem. Yasna gritted her teeth, still fighting to keep her tone stable. I'd forgotten how hard this was, Yasna thought. Her very bones seemed to vibrate, sending pain through her body. If she released control, her lahel would adopt the note she had just awakened and she herself would disappear in a burst of flame. I undertook the charan, the prisoner sobbed. 
You can't affect me with awakening. That's what we tell you, Yasna said, holding forth the ruby again. I'm just a scratch, the man said. They didn't even tell me who the hit was until this afternoon. They left an hour ago, told me to watch the building and report if anyone came looking for them. Honestly, I don't know anything. Clenching her jaw against the pain and the danger, Yasna stroked the second ruby. It began to glow. That's all I know, the man promised. They hired me about a month ago. All they did was look around the city, get to know the layout of the castle. The first time we did anything was last night. What did you do? Yasna demanded. We hit a group of men traveling to the city, the man said. I just stood watch. They did the killing. I didn't know they were shard bearers, honestly. Shard bearers? Yasna asked, surprised, lowering the gemstone. It popped ineffectually, spraying her hand with red dust. The man nodded in his bonds, eyes closed, shivering slightly as he wept. Took them in their sleep, two of them with their guards. We buried the guards, but they took the bodies of the noblemen. I don't know what they wanted with them. Two shard bearers. Where was the group you attacked traveling from? Cross guard, the man whispered. By the winds, Yasna said, spinning toward her two stunned guard captains. You two wake up. Worry about my awakening later. Nelshendon shook his head, coming out of his stupor, regarding her with eyes that were alarmingly distrustful. Two shard bearers, Nelshendon, Yasna said. From cross guard. The assassins killed Jezenrosh's delegation and took its place. They replaced his shard bearers with two young men who could claim to have been elevated so recently that no one in court would recognize them. By the Almighty, Kemnor exclaimed. That's where the rumors of Jezenrosh's plotting came from, Yasna said. Nanava doesn't just want to kill my brother, she wants to blame it on Jezenrosh. And the assassins have rooms in the Aleth section of the palace, Nelshendon whispered. A few doors down from those of the king himself. Chapter 31 Marin 7 Marin relaxed in one of the sitting rooms across the hallway from the feast hall. The room was warm and pleasant, lightly decorated in dark woods with a thick rug on the floor. He held a cup of rainwater sweetened with roche tree juice, his Dalinar prescribed allotment of wine long since imbibed. Renarin sat next to him. The young man had been acting strange, even for Renarin, ever since Arador's fight with Meridas. Renarin still held his first cup of wine, but instead of drinking it, he sat staring into the flagon's depths. Arador seemed far less disturbed by the confrontation. He stood by the room's hearth, speaking quietly with several men from Teth Kanar, a third city set at the point of the Sea of Chomar. Winning the Shardbearer's competition had lightened Arador's mood, not to mention redeemed him in the eyes of the other court members. Marin sighed, enjoying the peace. Marin had watched some thirty Shardbearer duels, and the quick motions, the cheering onlookers, and the clang of metal against metal had brought on a slight headache. Fortunately, as the evening had progressed, the court's men had lost much of their rowdiness. Those who wanted to get drunk did so, and the rest of them had trickled off to one of the sitting rooms. The competition's eventual winner was a young man who stood speaking with King Elokar on the far side of the room. Marin thought he recognized the man from the Prolier battlefield, but had never spoken with him. Arador had identified him as the fourth son of an eighth lord, which made his victory all the more triumphant. It was unlikely he would have ever managed to get a blade elsewhere. The young man stood with a look of disbelief on his face, one that Marin could hardly understand. Eventually, Elokar disengaged himself from the lucky shard-bearer. He strode from the room, bidding good night to several lords as he passed. The king probably had the right idea. 
Marin had no idea what hour of night it was, but it was probably well time they returned to Kolinar. Unfortunately, his chair was far too comfortable to abandon at the moment. He leaned back, closing his eyes and sighing in contentment. Marin felt it even with his eyes closed. He couldn't see the air change when the pendant somehow touched his skin, getting past his undershirt, but he could still feel it. He could sense the wind outside the building, the winds far away calling to him. He felt a burst of strength, a sudden awakening of soul and being. Nothing was ever dull within the embrace of the Glyph Ward. Nothing was ever lethargic, depressed, or listless when he could feel the wind. And yet he forced himself to reach up and pull the pendant away from his neck, tucking it back into position between shirt and underclothing. He hadn't been able to make himself take it off, not with the power and vivaciousness it seemed to lend. However, he still didn't trust it. His mother told stories of the whispering high storms and of the curses they could bring. Some day he would get rid of the pendant, just not today. Marin settled back into his chair, but the relaxation was tainted now that he had been reminded of the greater strength he was missing. I don't like this, Renarin mumbled from beside him. Marin raised an eyebrow. What is wrong with you tonight, anyway? Renarin looked up from his wine. What do you mean? Meridas tricked your brother and made a fool of him. Marin said. That's not going to change, but Arador did redeem himself. You don't have to focus on it so much. I haven't been thinking about Meridas, Renarin said, looking back down at his wine. I'm worried about Arador. He seems to be fine, Marin said. From the pieces of conversation Marin had heard, Arador was deeply engaged in an attempt to get a particular sea silk caravan to pass through Kolinar. Lord Dalinar and Lady Canet had retired back through the oath gates a few hours before, leaving Arador to handle the evening's financial discussions. He's been shooting glances toward those two men all night, Renarin said. Marin frowned. Which two men? Renarin nodded at two noblemen who stood by the far wall, drinks held in their hands but not touching their lips. Marin recognized them. They were the two shard bearers from Crossguard the men Jezenrosh had sent. The younger one wore a dark expression. He was the one who had been embarrassed so soundly earlier in the evening, when Elokar had demanded to know why Jezenrosh had not come to the dueling competition. Why would Arador care about those two? Marin asked. I don't know, Renarin replied, but he does. I can see it. Arador followed them here to this room. He keeps standing alone as if waiting for someone to approach him. However, it's never those two. Not yet. Marin shook his head, leaning back and closing his eyes. The palace guards are right, Renarin. You're a strange, strange man. Am I? Renarin asked. Look. Marin focused his eyes open. Ardor stood distracted from his conversation, obviously paying little attention to his two companions who were now speaking to one another. His eyes watched Jezenrosh's two shard-bearers, who were leaving the room with a quick gait. Marin raised an eyebrow as Arador bid farewell to the men from teth Canar, then strolled nonchalantly over toward Marin and Renarin. "'I'm going to go stretch my legs for a moment,' he said. "'Wait for me here. I'll be back shortly.' He didn't even wait for a reply before following the two shard-bearers from the room. Marin glanced toward Renarin. Follow him? Renarin asked. Definitely, Marin replied, picking up his shard-blade and jumping from the chair. The two of them ducked out into the hallway. A doorway just opposite them led to the feast hall with its food-littered tables and occasional drunken slumberer. The hallway lamps were lit, and it was easy to see Arador to the right, moving quickly down the passageway as he caught up to the two shard-bearers and walked in step beside them. What are those three planning? Marin asked with a frown, sneaking out behind them. Arador's trio stopped, and Marin pulled Renarin aside into a pillar alcove. 
He peeked around the corner to see Arador speaking quietly with the two others, his face frustrated. A few moments later, the two shard-bearers stalked away, leaving Arador alone in the corridor. Come on, Renarin said, slipping out of Marin's grasp and scurrying toward his brother. Marin flushed as Arador turned and saw them, then waved for them to stay where they were. He approached, a deep frown on his face, his eyes still turned toward the men disappearing in the distance. Arador, what's going on? Marin asked. Those men were supposed to bring me a message from Jezenrosh, Arador said. About what? Marin asked. It's not important, Arador said with a distracted wave of his hand. They said they didn't know what I was talking about, even though Jezenrosh promised to give me a reply. I find it hard to believe that he would forget. Arador, Renarin said urgently. The king left the room right before those men. You think he might be meeting with them? Arador asked. No, Renarin said. Those two didn't drink all night, and they didn't mingle. They took part in the Shardbearer's competition, but they were both eliminated early. They fought very carefully in the first few rounds and appeared very skilled, but then were defeated through simple mistakes, as if they wanted to progress far enough not to stand out but also didn't want to draw attention by doing too well. Arador mulled over his brother's words. Come on, he finally said. Arador led them forward through the maze of interconnecting hallways that crossed the ten wings of the first palace. Arador took a different route than the shard-bearers had, but he moved quickly, leading Marin and Renarin in a quick half-jog that looped them back toward the royal quarters. The hallways here were dark. Lanterns burned on their wall brackets, but there were no chandeliers, and only every other lantern was lit to save oil. Marin stopped beside Arador, puffing slightly from their dash and the excitement of the moment. The hallway was silent. Arador paused for a moment, then moved as if to start again. Renarin, however, held up a hand, head cocked to the side. A few moments later, Marin heard it too. Footsteps. Loud, clinking footsteps, as if... The two shard-bearers rounded an intersection just ahead, now clad in shard-plate. They had been joined by about ten men in simple dark clothing, all of whom were armed with maces or clubs. The two shard-bearers stopped with a clink when they saw Arador. One of them wore dark gray and gold. The second was the green warrior with the thin blade Marin had watched duel. Did Jezenrosh put you up to this? Arador asked, his voice ringing in the empty stone hallway. Or did you decide to do it on your own? The shard-bearers did not respond. Their group of common warriors stood hesitantly behind them. Killing the king will do you no good, Arador said. My father will never stand for it. I warned Jezenrosh not to be absent from the night's festivities. I warned him that he might lose his title. Elikar might be a fool, but greater is the fool who heedlessly provokes him. The older of the two shard-bearers motioned to his soldiers with a quick gesture, and they split, each group heading down a different hallway behind him. They could easily reach the king's quarters by a more roundabout method. The shard-bearers said not a word, stepping forward, long lines of smoke forming from their hands. Marin, Renarin, go and warn the king's guard, Ardor said, eyes fixed on the two shard-bearers as he summoned his own blade. Marin paused. Jezenrosh's shard-bearers walked forward with foreboding steps. These men would not follow protocol, not when assassinating the king was their knight's task. Marin felt an itch of fear regarding their gleaming shard-plate, remembering how much of a difference it had made in the knight's duels. With scrambling fingers, Marin pulled out his belt-knife and cut the strings holding the metal sheath over his blade. The sheath clanged to the stone floor, releasing the blade from its grip. Suddenly the weapon felt balanced, even alive in Marin's hands. Its hilt wasn't completely straight, but formed so that his grip locked perfectly into place as if it were another set of hands clasping with his own. Marin stepped forward, standing in a dueling stance beside his friend. Arador smiled, though his eyes were reserved. Renarin, go, Arador said, to the king's chambers first, then to the royal guardhouses if you have time. But, Renarin said, voice worried, go, Arador snapped. Ten heartbeats passed, three shard blades formed. 
Renarin paused only a moment longer, then took off at a dash. I saw their duels, Arador said in a low voice, releasing the clasp on his cloak and nodding for Marin to do likewise. The older one is the better of the two. I'll take him. You take the younger one. Fight defensively. If we can hold them long enough, others will come. Marin nodded, sweat tickling the side of his face, hands clammy as they gripped his blade. The two shard-bearers attacked in tandem. Breaking protocol instantly, they both pressed toward Marin, obviously trying to defeat the weaker of their two opponents first. Arador wouldn't let them. He charged the older man, the one in green, swinging his blade and forcing the man to engage him. The second assassin swung at Marin. The man's blade was long and straight, its length bearing designs that made it appear to be a series of stacked triangles. Marin ducked with a quick motion, Vasher's training prompting him to action without thought. His opponent's weapon sheared through the corridor wall behind him, leaving a long scar in the stone. Marin came out of his duck and fell immediately into Vasher's stance. He struck while his opponent was still off balance, but the man deflected the strike with the base of his sword, pushing Marin backward with a heave of plate-enhanced muscles. Marin stumbled with a grunt, barely staying upright. The shard-bearer struck with three sweeping blows, stepping forward with each one, forcing Marin to hop repeatedly backward. The final maladroit jump was too much, and Marin lost his footing, tripping and tumbling to the ground. The shard-bearer dove for the kill, but a sudden blow from behind struck the man's back, drawing his attention. Marin's opponent turned in surprise as Arador skidded past, then stopped in front of Marin. Both opponents pressed their advantage, but Arador faced them both, deflecting blow after blow. Marin shook his head, dispelling his dizziness as Arador fought and somehow stood against two shard-bearers at the same time. Marin could see Arador sweating from the exertion, however, and could see the man's arms quiver after parrying each of the plate-enhanced strikes. He was barely staying ahead of their attacks, deflecting blades at the last moment, teetering on the edge of being overwhelmed. Marin jumped to his feet, throwing himself back into the contest. Arador stepped to the side, allowing Marin to face the younger shard-bearer again, and the two duels separated. This time Marin's opponent was careful to place his back to the open hallway. As he turned, Marin could see a long scar in the man's shard plate where Arador had struck him. Marin tried to remain calm, focused on his stance, letting training dictate his swings. Yet it was impossible not to notice his own deficiency. Basher had been right. He wasn't ready for dueling. He fought as best he could, but his opponent seemed to anticipate his moves. Marin knew only a couple of basic strikes, and the lack of variety made him predictable. He could not win this fight. Not fairly, at least. Use every advantage you have, Basher had said. Marin clenched his jaw as his opponent swung again, using the same sweeping three-strike attack he had used before. This time Marin jumped backward, not trying to parry, only trying to give himself a second of free time. He reached into his shirt pocket, pulling out the glyph ward and dropping it around his skin. The air's movements manifest to him and the wind's voice whispered to his mind. Unfortunately, he wasn't certain what good that would do. He had used the glyph ward in combat several times, but it had never been as effective as it had been that first day. He could see the air and could see men breathe, but that gave him little aid other than hinting at when an attack would come. Still, slight though it was, it gave him an advantage. He watched his opponent's breath, using it to judge the man's strikes. Each time the man inhaled, Marin jumped backward, getting out of sword range. The assassin attacked with increasing frustration, trying to catch Marin. The man's short blade cut slice after slice in the hallway's walls, shearing lanterns from their perches but never landing a blow. Coward! the man hissed, swinging again. Marin ducked away, glancing behind him, checking on Arador. His friend appeared to have adopted a similar tactic, staying out of range, trying to tempt his opponent into overextending himself. They couldn't afford a quick battle. Jezen Rosh's shard-bearers would overpower them. Unfortunately, the assassin's plate also lent them greater endurance. The battle had only lasted a few minutes, but Marin could already feel his reactions slowing. He was puffing from the exertion and the constant dodging, his arms pained from the occasional blow he had to block. The final attack came as a wave. Marin's enemy plunged suddenly forward, giving little hint of the offense, even through breath. 
He closed on Marin, swinging repeatedly, forcing Marin to fight rather than dodge. The assassin didn't pause, keeping Marin off balance. The offense pushed Marin backward toward Arador. Marin managed to block each of the blows until the man lashed out with an unexpected punch. Marin struck instinctually at the opening, hitting the man in the chest, but Shardplate stopped the blow. The fist took Marin on the shoulder. The force of the strike tossed him backward, and his blade tumbled from numbed fingers. The air in the room snapped back to translucence as the glyph ward ripped free, its leather string caught on an edge of the assassin's gauntlet. Marin fell to the floor again, his shard blade clanging to the marble a short distance away. Ardor looked up at the motion, distracted, and the green shard bearer thrust with his thin weapon, striking Ardor in the side of the chest. The blade sliced easily through flesh, sinking into Arador's chest up to the hilt and pinning him to the wall behind him. The green shardbearer whipped his sword free, and Arador slumped to the ground, screaming in pain, a trickle of blood smearing against the wall. Marin cried out, rolling to the side and reaching for Arador. Instead of his friend, however, his eyes focused on something else. The glyph ward lay on the marble, a speck of green against the white. Marin scrambled for the bit of stone, but he did so with despair. Evil or holy, it had done him little good so far. Hopefully Renarin had warned the king's guards. Hopefully they would be able to raise a defense to stop these shardbearers from killing the king. But it was too late for him. Marin grasped the glyph ward even as his opponent raised his blade for the final blow. Marin could see the air around the blade as it hung, ready to fall. He would watch the air part as the weapon killed him. He heard the wind in his mind calling him. Marin called back, Come to me. The glyph ward flared in his hand, bursting to light with a bright green flame searing Marin's flesh. He cried out in pain, but could not let go. The palace shook, the hallway shuddered as if in pain, and then Marin heard it, a low moan, like the call of an enormous beast. Jezenrosh's assassins both paused, turning confused eyes toward the far end of the hallway, which was the source of the sound. A few scraps of cloth blew into the hallway, followed by a swirl of dust. The moan approached, the stones trembling faster and faster and faster. The glyph ward continued to burn in Marin's hand, the agony searing him to the bone, the unnatural green light growing brighter. And then it hit. A tempest of air, like an entire high storm channeled into a single gust, crashed through the confines of the small hallway. It smashed against the four combatants, dark with dust and debris, entire tapestries and rugs carried by its fury. It roared in Marin's ears, no longer just speaking to his mind, but screaming with the howl of a chained creature finally let free. It blew stronger than the fierce summer storms Marin had occasionally been caught in during harvest. It drove grit and sand into his skin, forcing him to curl up against the marble. Above him, his opponent was thrown backward by the force of the wind. Another body crashed to the floor a short distance from Marin. The green shard bearer also knocked to the ground. Through the wind, Marin could see the air curling strangely away from the man's shard plate, as if the supernatural metal were struggling to protect him but failing. The pain in Marin's palm flashed, then died. The storm slackened, then calmed, then vanished, leaving bits of string and fluff floating lazily to the ground. Marin groaned, holding his injured hand to his chest and sitting up, dust streaming from his clothing, his shoulders still pulsing with agony from the plate-enhanced punch. Green dust, all that remained of the glyph ward, trickled from his still-closed fist. There was a clink from beside him, and Marin turned dazed eyes toward the sound. The green shard-bearer rolled over, shaking his head as he reached for his blade. The motion ended in a jerk as Arador thrust a sword through the man's faceplate. Arador stumbled, holding his side and slumping to his knees beside the man he had killed. The other one. Marin lurched to his feet, forcing himself to ignore the pain of his injured hand and shoulder. The second shard-bearer had been thrown a good distance down the hallway. The man stood with a daze, then looked toward his blade, which lay on the ground a short ways in front of him, half the distance between himself and Marin. Both dashed forward at the same time. 
Marin reached out as he ran, snatching Arador's blade, which stood upright, sticking from the green shardbearer's face. The weapon slipped free easily, though it sat unfamiliarly in Marin's hand. The gray shardbearer moved more quickly, plate enhancing his motions. The man scooped up his blade, then swung toward Marin with a powerful blow. Marin ducked the attack, feeling it slice the air above him, and came up with his own swing, smashing his blade into the man's back, directly in the scarred line where Arador had struck earlier. The man jerked in mid-step, pulling Arador's blade from Marin's grasp. The weapon remained lodged in place, seeping blood at its edges as the shardbearer collapsed with a crash of metal against stone. Marin slumped to the ground as he heard voices approaching. He could only hope they were on the right side, for he knew he wouldn't have the strength to face another foe. Chapter 32 Yasna 8 Yasna stepped around the corpse of an assassin, waving away the soldier who tried to shield her from the scene of death. She held up her dress, stepping over the pool of blood, and pushed her way into the king's quarters. A royal captain approached, but Nel Shendon cut him off, whispering quietly to the man and sending him away. Elokar sat on his audience throne, leaning forward in thought, his expression dark. He was unwounded. The assassins had reached his outer hallway, but a disturbance raised by Renarin had alerted his guards to the danger in time. Nanava had failed. Yasna's eyes thinned as she focused on the queen, sitting on a stool at the king's side, a hand resting on his arm in mock sympathy. Yasna had been too slow, but Dalinar's sons had proven themselves true to the honor their father had taught them. Meridas stood at the side of the room, speaking with Balinmar and several shard bearers, displaying a proper look of outrage at the night's events. She even heard him give a moan of disappointment that he hadn't arrived in time to help Arador fight. Balinmar met Yasna's eyes with a relieved gaze. He thought that the threat was over. He had been fooled, as she nearly had been. Elokar looked up as he noticed Yasna. He shall pay for this, the queen said. I knew Jezenrosh was insubordinate, but I had hoped he would see reason. I should have listened more carefully to Balinmar's warnings. Yasna shot a look at Nelshendon, who was still trying to convince the guard captain to leave them alone with the king. He appeared to be having little success. Elokar, Yasna said. We need to talk. The king frowned. Surely you don't expect me to ignore an attempt on my life? Jezenrosh's own shard bearers tried to kill me tonight. There is more to this attempt on your life than you know, my king, Yasna said. Dismiss the others. We must speak in private. Elokar paused, sitting upright in his throne. Eventually he waved the guard captain toward him and gave the man instructions in a low voice. The captain obviously didn't like what he heard, but he bowed and waved the guards and other nobility to follow him out. The people trailed out, a questioning Balinmar included. Yasna shot him a reassuring glance. Meridas, you stay, Elokar commanded. Meridas nodded and remained where he was. Nanava also made no move to leave, and the king made no move to dismiss her. Yasna waited expectantly, her mouth a thin line, but the king met her gaze defiantly. Finally, she walked forward, grabbing Elokar by the arm. He resisted at first, then sighed and let her pull him over to the side of the room, out of Nanava's earshot. The queen watched them with curious eyes, but remained by the throne. Where are Arador and Renarin? Yasna asked quietly, folding her arms as Nel Shendon closed the doors, then walked over to keep a wary eye on Meridas. Arador was wounded. Elokar said. He is in the care of the palace healers. I sent Renarin to Kolinar to speak with his father. Our uncle has grown tired of war. Surely you've seen it. If Dalinar is going to be persuaded to support me against Jezenrosh, he will need the word of his sons on what happened this night. My lord, 
Yasna said, uncertain where to begin. She eyed Meridas, who lounged against a pillar on the side of the room. What would be the best way to explain? Brother, she said. I think Meridas might have had something to do with the attack tonight. What? Elokar asked with amusement. What possible reason could he have for such an act? Yasna flushed. I think he and your wife might be seeing each other, Elokar, she said. We need to discuss this in... Elokar laughed, cutting her off. He glanced toward Nanava, who was still watching them with a curious expression. She thinks you and Meridas are lovers, Elokar told her in a loud voice. The queen chuckled in amusement, and Elokar turned back to Yasna. Really, Yasna, I don't have time for your paranoia, especially after Jezenrosh's assassins. I don't think Jezenrosh sent those men tonight, Yasna said, too loudly. Nanava looked back toward them at the sound, then rose to wander toward the two. What? Elokar asked with a snort. You think his shard bearers acted on their own volition? Yasna had no choice but to continue. Those weren't Jezenrosh's shard bearers, she said. The men he sent were killed last night, on their way to the first city. Their blades were stolen, and their entourage was replaced with assassins. Elokar moved to open his mouth, but Yasna cut him off. I have proof, she said sharply. As we speak, my other guard captain is delivering a captive to the royal dungeon. The man can authenticate my words. Once you hear what he has to say, you'll realize that Jezenrosh was not behind the attempt on your life. The true assassins are your wife and Meridas. Elokar glanced toward his wife, who had paused a short distance away, her expression dark. Nanava has been delivering large sums of money to the false company run by the assassins, Yasna explained, gaining momentum as she saw guilt in Nanava's eyes. She hired them to have you killed and implicate Jezenrosh. Elokar's mood became troubled, and he stood for a moment, thoughtful. Finally, he looked up at Nanava, his face angered. I thought you were more cautious than this. You have no idea how cautious I was, Nanava said. Your sister is just inhumanly nosy. I warned you she would be trouble. Yasna felt a sharp sense of shock creep up her spine. She looked from Elokar to his wife, then back again. By the winds. You knew? Elokar's look was confirmation enough. But... Nanava and Meridas, Yasna said. What about them? Elokar chuckled. The sound, cold rather than mirthful, made Yasna shiver. That part, dear sister, you contrived on your own. You knew, Yasna mumbled, stunned. The assassins were never meant to succeed. They were to fight their way here where you could pretend to defeat them on your own. That's why the assassins took the bodies of the two shard bearers with them, so that you would have corpses to show for the apparent attempt on your life. Elokar nodded. The rumors, Yasna said. You made them. You used Balinmar somehow. You led him along, knowing the man would be eager to prove his use to you. Balinmar is a link to my father, Elokar said. If I can claim to be acting on information the old fool helped provide, I can gain the support of the more traditional elements of the kingdom. Everything crumbled around her. Elokar, why? She whispered. The king regarded her sufferingly. You yourself told me that the noblemen have grown tired of war, Yasna. Jezenrosh needs to be dealt with but I've known for some time that gathering support against him would be difficult. The nobility needed to be given a little nudge to help them along. Yasna felt like collapsing. She stumbled weakly, leaning back against the stone wall. 
You've always underestimated me, Elokar said quietly. You always assumed that I couldn't rule alone. You claimed to love me, but with that love, you presumed to control my court on my behalf. You never stopped to think that maybe your help wasn't needed, nor was it appreciated. Elokar turned and nodded toward the other end of the room. Yasna spun just in time to see Meridas jump forward. Nelshendon reacted belatedly. He had been watching the king with amazed eyes. Nelshendon turned just in time for Meridas to ram a small dagger into his chest. The soldier gasped once. Then Meridas placed a hand over the man's mouth, keeping him from yelling. That didn't stop Yasna. No, she screamed, rushing forward. Meridas released Nelshendon's mouth and snapped his hand forward, grabbing Yasna by the shoulder. He held her carefully, not hurting her, but keeping her at bay as he pulled the dagger free. Nelshendon slumped to the ground. No guards came at her call. Elokar must have ordered them to remain outside, despite what they might hear. Meridas released Yasna, and she fell to her knees beside Nelshendon, watching even as the light fled from his eyes, his mouth open, his body twisted in pain. Nelshendon, she whispered. He knew far too much, Elokar said, approaching his chair and seating himself again. Besides, his affection for you was unseemly. I will send you a new guard as a wedding gift a man with a little more rank and experience. Yasna reached forward, resting her hand on the side of Nelshendon's dead face. She would not cry. She survived as she had taught herself long ago, during her days in Thalina. She took all of the grief, guilt, and pain and crammed it into the piece of ice within her. She did not shake or weep. She simply looked up through cool eyes at the man who was her brother. I will not forget this, Elokar. Bah, the king said with a wave of his hand. Spare me your preaching, Yasna. You do not know what I know about Jezenrosh. The man needs to be stopped. Our kingdom depends upon my ability to act before he is ready. Meridas, take your betrothed to her rooms and see that men you trust are posted at her door. Then seek out her second captain and his captive. Make certain their knowledge dies with them. Yasna did not turn her gaze from Elokar as she rose. She watched him, eyes locked on his face, forcing herself to see the mistake she had made. Gone was the boy she had given love and protection. In his place, was a man who deserved neither. Elokar turned away, a twinkle of shame in his eyes, as Meridas forcibly led Yasna out into the hallway. Chapter 33 Jack 6 Jack Sanson Villano, truthless of Shinovar, delivered his captive as instructed. Avon had set aside a room for the girl, one without windows, guarded by five soldiers. Jack gave her to their care, watching as they closed and locked the door behind the red-haired youth. Why is this girl of such importance? he wondered, lingering. She was of good birth, but not that good. Perhaps it was her tie to the Lady Yasna Colin. A tool for bargaining, perhaps? He left the palace behind, seeking out his master for the second time in one night. Idiot king no longer, Avon now moved openly, wishing to be witnessed by as much of the Vaden nobility as possible. Jack found the man near the gates to Vaden City, standing in a ring of torches, looking out at the army which was still camped beyond. Jack approached, and the guards let him pass without comment. You found the girl? Avin asked turning toward Jack, watching his lips. Still deaf? But he sounded so natural. Yes, Jack replied. She was at the competition. Avin nodded. And there was an attempt on the king's life? 
two shard bearers, sent by Elokar's own portion, Jack said. They were not successful. They were never intended to be, Avan said cryptically. Alethkar will rise in civil war. It seems to be common these days. Jack did not respond. There was much activity in the army camp, a strange parallel of the fervor that had struck Baden City only hours before. Torches and lanterns scurried between the different sections of the army, and men stood alert, weapons drawn. Jack could hear the ringing of weapons in the background, and flame-lit smoke curled in the air from several groups of tents. This was still an enemy army, despite Avin's stunt in killing Talshech. Baden City would still be captured, Avin killed. Slaying Talshech had done little but delay. What was Avin's plan? It's almost over, Avin said. There was something odd to his tone. Jack realized that he had been wrong. Avin's accent wasn't gone. He still retained a noticeable flatness to his tone, but his words sounded mostly natural now, compared to what they had been like before. Someone who didn't know Avin was deaf might judge the slight oddity to be a personality quirk. How? Jack asked. Avin didn't notice the comment. Jack stepped up, drawing Avin's attention. How? he repeated. Your voice. How did you do it? Speech coaches, Avin said absently. They taught me to exaggerate the dullness of my words than to sharpen their clarity. I wasn't completely deaf as a child. I remember some of what it is like to speak and hear. I'm told I don't sound perfect and likely never will, but it suits my purposes. How did you know you could kill Tal Shech? Jack asked. You knew from the ballads he chose? You knew he would be impetuous, and that you could defeat him in sword play? Avon smiled, looking back toward the tents. No, he said. On that I gambled. The Vedan lords are tyrants and warriors. We play prettily by the words of Bajardin, but at our hearts we are despots. They would never accept a leader who could not defeat an opponent in battle. There will be other duels, Jack warned, ones you cannot win. Your surprise is expended. I will appoint champions, Avin said. One win is enough, for now. By the time this is all through, no one will even remember I won that duel by chance. By chance. Jack shook his head, uncertain how to judge this man once called idiot. You only have nine birds left, Jack said carefully. Avon inhaled softly, his eyes flashing with rage, intolerance. It was gone so quickly that Jack missed it. The king turned from Jack, waving for the royal soldiers to move forward. They did as commanded, carrying a collection of cloth and poles to the area just outside the city gates. A few minutes later, they had erected an open-sided pavilion, one inscribed with a massive glyph, the Canaran symbol for peace. Who will you parley with? Jack asked. They still fight amongst themselves. It has been decided already, Avon said. Those who resist do so out of frustration, not out of hope. You decided their new leader for them. Jack paused. Me? Avin nodded. Everyone with a more suitable claim is now dead. Come. Jack followed, unconvinced. However, in accordance with Avin's implication, a contingent of soldiers left the gathering of tents, marching forward to the parley tent. At their head was a middle-aged man Jack did not recognize. Avon seated himself in a chair provided by one of his attendants, then nodded for the newcomer to take the opposite chair. The man did not sit. He was shorter and did not have the traditional look of a Vaden warrior. His features weren't hard enough, his eyes too keen with cleverness. His shard blade was not summoned, but two of his soldiers carried theirs openly. 
I do not see what we have to discuss, the man said. But you came to my tent anyway, Lord Ilhadal Davar, Oven said. That implies at least curiosity. I wished only to see you, and to hear your words with my own ears, Lord Ilhadal said. I see the stories are true. It appears that our idiot made fools of us all. Some men do not take well to such mockery. Are you saying that you're completely surprised? Arvin asked with amusement. That you've never heard reports from your spies that the king might not be the fool he implied? Ilhadal did not reply. Come now, Ilhadal, Arvin said. I know you. You are ambitious like Talshech but you are not the impetuous buffoon your cousin was. You are patient and you are careful. You prefer a building subtlety to a sudden and obnoxious crescendo. You make plans for your future and make allegiances with skill. Ilhadel snorted. What do you know of me, king? he snapped. We have never met nor spoken. You would be surprised, Arvin said. But that is irrelevant. You can't afford to attack me now. Your army is grand, but it is barely under your control. Ours is a superstitious people, my lord. They may have given you their hesitant support, but they will break if you try to take the throne from one the Almighty obviously chose himself. Ilhadal snorted again, but Jack could see concern in his eyes. Part of what Oven had said, at least, was true. What do you propose, then? Ilhadal said. I have an army, but no throne. You have a throne, but no army. Instability aside, I think one of us is in a far better position. You have a daughter, do you not? Oven said offhandedly. Ilhadal froze. What of Shinri? he growled. She is safe in Alethkar, Avon smiled, leaning forward. You misunderstand me, my lord. Consider this. You will never sit on the throne of the three houses. Ilhadal's face darkened. Avon raised a finger, speaking quietly. But your grandson might. Ilhadal stood in silence. Then, slowly... He seated himself in the offered chair. Speak on. I will need something in return for my good faith, Oven said. Ilhadal's mood darkened even further in the torchlight. I would think that your continued reign would be gift enough. Oven shook his head. I did not gather this Omri to let it disperse unfulfilled. The Aleth king will soon go to war with his countrymen. Alethkar is already weakened from years of battle and from the need to keep a controlling force in Prala. The civil war will be quick, but it will be destructive. If a strong force were to move in and crush the last of their armies— This gave Ilhadal pause. They are our allies, Arvin, he noted. Then let us be civil and remove from them the burden of rule, Oven replied. They obviously cannot maintain it themselves, though it was kind of them to capture Prala for us. Tell me, Ilhadal, why would you want to deliver your grandson one throne when you could give him three? It will not be as easy as you imply, Ilhadal said. My holdings are to the north. The borders of Alethkar are always well patrolled. They will hear of our coming, and they will unite against us. Instead of preying on their squabbles, we will restore their monarchy. Not if we don't go through the border, Aben said. See? Ilhadal asked. It would take too long to gather the Lochenran navy. Besides, Tethkanar would make the only suitable port— and it will be well defended, even in times of civil war. We won't use the sea either, Oven said. What then? Ilhadal demanded. The Oath Gates. 
Ilhadal snorted. Ridiculous. Even Elokar Kolin wouldn't be foolish enough to let an army through the Oath Gates. They need to be opened from both sides. Getting through the Oath Gate is my concern, Avin said. Your duty is to return to your men and secure hold of your forces. I will proclaim our allegiance. That should give you help. Once you are finished there, fetch your wife. She has a right of decision to exercise. Part Two Chapter Thirty Four Dalinar Two Even after two and a half months back from the war, the sweet breezes of Kolinar felt foreign to Dalinar. The fertile cliffs of the late, green with hanging vines and blooming rock buds, were unnatural to eyes accustomed to stormland browns. The winds, gentle even during summer high storms, seemed to taunt him with their weakness. Delinar stood on his palace balcony, his posture stiff, though he was alone. He had thought to find peace in returning to Kolinar, but peace was something that had been lost to him for far too long. When he closed his eyes, swords clanged and arrows hissed. When he walked the hallways of the palace, he saw memories of the dead, images of Nolanarin, his elder brother and king, images of his first wife, Kalkana, whose name had meant the Almighty's gift of peace. Worst were the memories of Shenaris. Dalinar's heir would have been almost thirty years old had the lad still lived. Peace was a lie. For Dalinar there would always be a war. If not a war he lived, then one he remembered. And if he began to think he might learn to avoid both, a messenger would visit his palace. This time there were two. My lord? The voice was so sweet, so uncertain. The messengers wait for you to answer them. They are unhappy. Dalinar turned his head toward Kane, and the girl immediately lowered her eyes, blushing. He could see her self-consciousness. She tried so hard to please him. He knew of her efforts, and he forced himself to be civil. Yet she was clever, and could sense his dissatisfaction, even if she couldn't understand that there was nothing she could ever do to remove it. No power in Roshar, not even the Almighty's hand itself, could force Dalinar to ever be this girl's husband in anything other than name. Tell them to wait, Dalinar ordered, turning away again. Kane retreated, leaving Dalinar to his unrest. He turned his eyes to the south. Over the ridge of the late he could see the Mount of Ancestors rising in the distance. On its eastern slope crouched Ral Aram, the first capital the city founded by the heralds themselves. During the two months following the end of the Prolier War, Elokar had moved his armies through the Oath Gate and organized them in the foothills below Ral Aram, ostensibly to see to their dismantlement. However, it took nearly as long to disband an army, collecting its gear, paying its wages, and organizing its registration, as it took to gather one, especially considering the travel time from Prala. Now that he had decided to attack Jezenrosh, Elokar would need barely a few days to reorient and reorganize his men. He could probably march on Crossguard with at least half his original numbers. Jezenrosh would never be able to match such a force. Still, he did hold the defensive advantage. Unlike the Prolans, the Aleth nobleman was well equipped, and had a good number of both Awakeners and Shardbearers. Even with superior numbers, Elokar would not find Crossguard an easy stone to break. Delinar shook his head. There was more to the coming war than tactics. There were two boys, young to Delinar despite their titles. Elokar, Jezenrosh, and Shenaris had played together as children. Even then Elokar had known that he would one day be king, and Jezenrosh had chafed at the arrogance he saw. Shenaris had always been the peacemaker. Dalinar could not take his son's place. There would be no peace now, not with assassins dead in Ral Aram. 
and so the separate messengers came running. Who would Dalinar, the grand tyrant Bane himself, support? Dalinar turned from the balcony, walking past the oak storm shutters and through his chambers. The messengers stood respectfully as he entered the audience hall. It was a small room, without grand columns or ostentation. Dalinar waved the men to sit, then took his own seat before them. Arador and Renarin waited in the back, along with several of Dalinar's tribute lords and the young shard-bearer Marin. Dalinar rested an elbow on the chair's armrest, rubbing his chin as he regarded the messengers. Both wore aleth blue, their cloaks emblazoned with a stylized coal glyph, Elokar's sunburst for the man on the left, Jezenrosh's storm winds for the man on the right. Neither messenger had been pleased to discover the other's presence. This is wrong, Delinar thought, so very wrong. Well, Elokar's messenger finally asked, what is your decision, Lord Delinar? Will you stand with your king, or will you join the traitor? My lord is no traitor, Jezenrosh's messenger snapped. His men tried to kill the king, Elokar's messenger said. After Elokar shamed them publicly before the entire court, the second man said, standing, what those men did for their own honor has nothing to do with Lord Jezenrosh. Enough, Delinar said, bringing silence to the room. The messengers turned toward him expectantly. Delinar sighed. I cannot choose between the sons of my brothers, and I will not take part in their squabbling. My house and those of my tribute lords will remain neutral. Any shard-bearer or lord beneath my rule who chooses to join either side will be stripped of rank and blade. Let them find another lord to follow if they think so flippantly of my commands. This is a dangerous move, Parshan, Elokar's messenger informed, his expression darkening. Be gone, Delinar said, rising. Both of you. Jezenrosh's messenger bowed stiffly, then turned and left. Elokar's messenger trailed behind. Know that the Kolinar oath gate will be sealed with the others, he said. The king's orders should you refuse to aid him. He cannot have a man he does not trust at his back. Dalinar turned from the messenger, not watching as the man left. A few seconds later, footsteps approached from behind. Is this wise, father? Arador's voice asked quietly. I will not choose between them, Delinar replied. Arador stepped to the side, moving so that he could see into Delinar's eyes. The boy's arm was still in a sling, his face pale from exertion. After the last week's ordeal, Arador had spent much time in bed recovering from blood loss and injury. This war is not just, father the boy said. Jezenrosh's men tried to kill the king, Delinar replied. Regardless of whether they acted on his orders, he is responsible for the sins of his men. That is the same argument Elokar used to take Renarin's blade, Arador said. I didn't believe it then, either. And if Jezenrosh did give them orders? Delinar asked. Arador paused. Then he looked back, his jaw determined. Something smells wrong here, father. Something about the assassin's attack, the letter Lady Yasna gave me. I spent these last few months in communication with Jezen Rosh, father. I don't think he would have done this. Delinar regarded the boy. Communication? What kind of communication? Arador glanced away. It's unimportant now. Delinar sighed. Arador's instincts were good. Something did indeed smell wrong. A king should not take up arms against his kinsmen, and an uncle should not be forced to watch his nephews kill one another. We will remain neutral, Arador, Delinar said firmly. Those are your orders. Delinar could sense the displeasure in his son's posture. Arador was young. Inaction felt worse to the boy than treason. Arador turned without responding, stalking from the room. The other occupants dribbled away after him, all except Kinney, who waited by the back wall, 
ever dutiful with her diminutive taller and wide eyes. Almighty forgive me for abandoning the one who dies, Delinar thought. Chapter 35 Shinri 6 They chose for Shinri a very pretty cell. In fact, confronted by the lush carpets, fine wardrobe, and lavish meals, Shinri found she could almost ignore the armed guards outside her door. She had little success in guessing the identity of her captors. Though the options were limited, so was her information. The most obvious choice was her own cousin, Tal Shech Davar. He supposedly had an army camped just outside Vaden City, and simple logic concluded that he probably held the throne as well. However, there was one great flaw in that supposition. As far as she knew, Tal Shech had no reason for wishing her captured. The other houses made far more likely culprits, for any of them might think to use her for her lineage imprisoning her in some desperate attempt to gain leverage over Tal Shech. If that were the case, however, her captors had made a grave mistake. Shinri had only met Tal Shech twice, and both times he had given her little notice. She was a distant cousin. He would not be warded off by her imprisonment, especially since his goal was the throne itself. Yet the days of her captivity passed without either threat or release. If House Vadenel held her, it did not try and use her in a bargain, and if Tal Shech did have an army outside the city, it did not attack. She cursed her tiny slit-like windows. Though the palace was on a hill, it was only a single story, and the city walls blocked most of her view. Peer as she might, she couldn't make out the glyphs on the cloaks of the wall-top guardsmen. She only knew that they were white, which meant that one of the three houses at least held the city. There was, of course, a third option. Tethryn had tried to kill King Elokar. House Renar obviously had plots of its own. She couldn't imagine what sequence of events could have given them control of Vaden's city, let alone allowed them to stave off Tal Shech's armies but she couldn't discount the possibility that she was in their hands. In fact, she couldn't discount much of anything. She spent her three days of imprisonment in apprehensive self-debate. As the hours trickled past, she grew increasingly anxious. The pain of ignorance was even more potent than her anger at being held captive. Just when she thought she would burst from frustration, she finally received a visit from her captor. It was not someone she had even bothered consider. Father? she asked with surprise, as the man walked in. Ilhadal Davar was a stern, well-groomed man of short stature. He had been past his prime in Shinri's youth, and the years had only made his aging more evident. Like most Vaden noblemen, he thought himself a soldier, but he bore none of the pragmatism that usually came with the profession. Ever worried about what others thought of him, Ilhadal was a man with too little imagination to support his potent ambition. Still, Shinri hadn't thought he would keep his own daughter captive. Perhaps he somehow earned passage, Shinri thought optimistically and he's come simply because he was worried about me. Not that he ever has worried about me before. Ilhadal gave her one of his characteristically unsympathetic glances. If there was any measure of concern in his eyes, she couldn't find it. Sit, he said, pointing to a stool. Shinri did as commanded, waiting to play her hand until she had more information. Ilhadal raised an eyebrow, as if surprised to see her following orders. He strode forward, broad white cloak set with the thick mane-like collar that her people preferred. He walked a full circle around the stool, studying her and rubbing his bearded chin. The Colin woman does good work, he finally said. 
I half expected you to throw a tantrum when I walked in, no matter what my informants told me about your progress. Shinri raised her chin, staring her father in the face. Lady Yasna is a woman of impeccable composure, father. I have learned much under her guidance. Ilhadal grunted. He did not sit, but remained standing, arms folded, regarding her with the eye of a tradesman at market. Why would he keep me in here, Shinri thought, furiously trying to put her aforementioned learning to use. He obviously has some measure of authority in the palace. The guards treated him respectfully as they let him in. His blood ties to Tal Shech are as weak as mine, but perhaps he has managed to make himself an advisor to the man. That doesn't explain why either would give orders for me to be kept under guard. Why would he lock her up? Two conclusions came to mind. Either he expected her to try and escape the city, or he expected others to try and get to her. The first was possible. He obviously still regarded her somewhat as the impetuous child of her youth. The second didn't seem very likely at all. Even considering her wardship, she was no one of any great import. You know, he said, I blessed the Almighty when the house leaders asked me if I would give you to Alethkar as part of the treaty. Until that moment, I had been convinced that you would never be of any good to me. Yet because of the treaty, I could be rid of you and serve the house at the same time. He paused, eyeing her. Never in all my imaginations did I think that I might get yet another chance to use you. Shinri frowned. Your wardship is over, Ilhadal said, turning toward the door. Your stepmother has exercised her right of decision. Attendants will be sent to prepare you for the ceremony. Only years of training beneath Yasna let Shinri shake off her shock quickly enough to speak before he left. Who, Shinri? You have to find out who. Tal Shek? she guessed. He was unmarried now. The death of his wife had been part of what set off his determination to take the throne. Ilhadal paused, then smiled, shaking his head. No, Shinri, he said, as if slightly confused himself. Tal Shek is dead. I lead House Devar now. You, Shinri asked, but you were 14th in line for the house title. I know, he said. There have been many casualties recently. Shinri studied him, quelling her horror. Her father had always been an ambitious man, but not that kind of ambitious. He was the pandering courtier, the lesser nobleman who thrived on the barest bit of recognition from his superiors. He was mildly clever, true, but he was not a plotter or an assassin. Or at least, he hadn't been. I see it in your eyes, Shinri, he said from near the doorway. I see it in everyone's eyes. Facts have made the truth irrelevant, it appears. Regardless of the means, I was placed in the difficult position of thinking I must kill my king in order to serve my country. Fortunately, another option presented itself. I can only hope that history will judge me for what I have done and not for what others assume was my hand. Another option presented itself. It took Shinri only a few moments to work out the answer. Him? she asked with shock. I'm to be married to the idiot king? Ilhadal nodded. Not so much an idiot any longer, it seems. Perhaps never one at all. The king has undergone something of a transformation. The common people are already convinced it was the Almighty's work. The nobility are more skeptical, but I suppose we always are. The idiot king. For so long she had assumed herself for no one but Tethryn, she hadn't really considered what his death meant for her future. Of course she would have to be married to another. A woman's power came from her husband's rank. 
even if her father hadn't become first prince of House Davar, her fostering to Lady Asna would have made her a prized marriage. But Aven Vedenal? Her father's words about a transformation made no sense. Had someone trained Aven to act less foolish? But even if that were so, he would still have the mind of a child. What kind of marriage was that? Yasna's training whispered that it was a very good one. Shinri would be one of the most powerful women in Yakaved, her father the prince of one house, her husband the prince of another, and king of all three. Avan's mental weakness would be a small problem, one she could use to her advantage. She would have a great deal of freedom, and even power, assuming she could gain some measure of control over him. The Shinri side of her, however, the piece that Yasna hadn't ever been able to train away, wanted to scream in horror at the idea. She glanced around covertly for something to break or unravel, eventually choosing a nearby plant from which she could pluck a few leaves. When? Shinri asked, crumpling a crisp leaf in her hand, feeling the sap wet her palm. Soon, her father promised knocking for the guards to open her door. Wait, she said, standing. Can I at least leave? Why must you keep me here like a prisoner? What do you fear, father? He glanced back at her, then stepped out and waved for the guards to shut the door. Chapter 36 Marin 8 Marin splashed a cupful of water on his face, sighing in pleasure as the cool liquid washed away the sweat and fatigue of a day spent sparring. Around him the Shield Home Monastery grounds bustled with unusual activity. Kolinar wasn't at war, not yet, but Lord Dalinar's pronounced neutrality and the subsequent sealing of the Oath Gate felt like a bad sign. Citizens and lords alike came to Shield Home to work out frustrations and perhaps to prepare, just in case. Marin was beginning to learn that the world of a nobleman was far more morally ambiguous than he had presumed. The ballads spoke of right and wrong, and they always warned their audience which side to believe in. Even when a figure was portrayed as both evil and heroic, such as Jarna the Tyrant, there was always a separation of actions from character. To become a conqueror was bad. However, fighting with honor and bravery, as Jarna always had, was good. Those ideals seemed frail when compared with Alethkar's current situation. Assassination was an evil act, not to mention unheroic. But what if those assassins had been sent to stop a man who was planning tyranny himself? Many whispered that King Elokar, who had turned back from Prala reluctantly, had been planning now to invade Yakaved. The rumors said this was why the king hadn't dismissed his armies, and why he was so quick to react against Jezenrosh's offense. Surely planning an invasion of the south, a land held to be one of Alethkar's truest allies, was a dishonorable act. If Jezenrosh knew of this and tried to stop it— was he justified in using assassins against his own king? Marin could tell he wasn't the only one worried about this dichotomy. The people wanted an answer. The biggest problem in Kolinar wasn't the fact that their countrymen were at war. The real problem was that Lord Dalinar, the most revered man in all of Alethkar, refused to tell his people which side was right. It left men wondering and whispering. Perhaps Lord Dalinar didn't know what was right either. That possibility scared them more than anything else. Don't think so hard, kid, Chadron said. You're giving me a headache. Marin smiled at the aging monk. After Marin's battle during the assassination attempt, something had changed between Marin and Vasher's little band of monks. Instead of just regarding Marin as Vasher's apprentice, the eight men had begun to accept him as one of their own. Though Vasher was still Marin's trainer, the others had begun to joke and spar with Marin, 
and they generally seemed to regard him with the fondness one gave a little brother or junior team member. Chadron? Marin asked. Who do you think's right? Jezenrosh or the king? The elder warrior shrugged. I haven't met either one. You don't have to meet them to know if they're right or not, Marin prodded. Oh, I don't know, Chadron replied with a wide, gap-toothed smile. Whether or not a fellow's right often depends on how much I like him. Tatter, a leaner man whose only remaining hairs were completely gray, snorted. I guess the wenches are always right then, eh, Chadron? You seem to like them more than you like anyone. Wouldn't know any more, Chadron said, raising a cup to his lips and obscuring his face. Monks don't do things like visit the wenches. Wouldn't be proper of them. Tatter snorted his response to that comment. No, Marin complained. What do you really think? About the king's war, I mean. Such things aren't meant for discussing by you, little spearman, Basher said from a short distance away, and even less meant for us. Lord Dalinar is a wise man. If he says that it isn't for us to choose sides, then we won't choose sides. Personally, I doubt either one of them are right. So, was what I did in the palace wrong? Marin asked, turning toward his trainer. Should I have let the assassins pass? No, boy, Basher said. What you did was right, even if you did go against my command that you refrain from sparring. But I didn't spar. I— Oh, he knows, Chadron said with a laugh. He's just getting on you, kid. Marin caught a hint of a smile in Basher's eyes. What you did was right, Basher repeated. You saved your king's life. It isn't your place to decide if that life was worthy of saving or not, though it is Lord Dalinar's place to decide whether or not his armies will act against Jezenrosh. Marin nodded. Now, how is that shoulder? Basher asked. Marin rolled his arm. The bruise is almost gone now, he said. You're lucky, Basher said. He must not have hit you square on. A punch like that from a man in plate should have broken a few bones. Marin nodded, rubbing his arm. The motion only reminded him of his other wound, however, the one that he hadn't told anyone about. Though he had felt the glyph ward burn in his palm as if it were molten, it had left no mark. His hand had been numb for three days following the assassination attempt, but feeling had slowly returned. Now he could feel no remnant of either pain or numbness. No one knew what to make of the torn tapestries and rugs. Arador had been dazed following the battle and didn't seem to remember the storm that had blown through the hallway. Jezenrosh's shard-bearers were dead, and no one else had seen the winds. And so Marin had remained quiet about the event, pleading confusion as to what had brought so much dust into the hallway. He tried to ignore the hollow sensation he felt now that the glyph ward was gone. Its power had been expended, the magic locked within its stone gone. It was best to move on. Hey, Vasher, Chadron said. The kid's getting pretty good, eh? Bet you didn't expect him to be able to take down a shard-bearer and plate like that. Marin blushed. That was mostly Arador, he said. I was so useless in the fight it's a wonder I didn't cut off my own leg. Several of the men laughed at this, but Chadron wasn't finished. You should teach him how to skep, Vasher, the burly warrior said. He's probably ready. Hey, that's a good idea, one of the other men, Danib, said. Several of the others nodded their approval. Vasher glared at the group of monks. He's not ready, he said. The boy hasn't even bonded his blade yet. He can't skip until then anyway. We might not have much more time to train him, Vasher, Tatter said, shaking his head. Great things are happening outside our little monastic island. How long will it be before some lord decides to drag the boy away to war? The shard bearers he duels on the battlefield won't care if he's ready or not. You should at least train him to defend himself. Vasher continued to glare. 
He really is ready, Vasher, Danif put in. You've heard Lord Arador praise the boy's dueling skill. He's twice as good as any of us were at his age, and he hasn't even had that blade a hundred days yet. Vasher grunted, studying Marin. Marin was uncertain what they were talking about, but he was equally certain that whatever it was, he wanted to learn it. Yeah, Vasher, he joined in. At least teach the boy how to defend himself. Vasher snorted with a slight smile, then nodded toward the other side of the courtyard where a large group of noblemen were sparring in the sand. See the shard bearer in blue? Vasher asked, pointing out a younger man in bright blue shard plate. Put on your plate and go challenge him to a duel. Marin paused. But you told me not to duel. Last week you couldn't wait to embarrass yourself. Now you're arguing with me? Get! Marin jumped, rushing over to ask one of the younger monks to invite the other shard bearer to duel. Then Marin quickly went to the dressing square, where several other young monks helped him don the shard plate. Marin knew the man he was about to spar. His name was Kalvan, a distant cousin to the Kolin. The man had done moderately well in the dueling competition, finishing near the middle of the pack of contestants. Several groups of onlookers gestured and nudged one another as Marin approached the dueling ring. Some smirked in amusement, others were simply curious. Though the rumors rightly claimed that Arador had really been the one to save the king, Marin had taken part in the battle. If people had been curious about him before, they were doubly so now. So what will it mean to them if I lose this duel? Marin thought with sudden apprehension, realizing that most of the courtyard had stopped its sparring to gather around his ring. What will it mean if I win? Marin raised his blade to indicate that he was ready, and Kalvan stepped forward. The man's stance was different from Marin's. He kept the blade closer to his body, its tip raised higher in the air. Marin struck first. Propelled by the speed of shard plate, he danced across the sand, swinging his blade in the sweeps Vasher had taught him. His opponent parried each blow with ease, then delivered a strike directly against Marin's helm. Marin pulled to a stop in the sand, gritting his teeth as the scorekeeper awarded a point to Kalvan. Focus, Marin told himself, repeating Vasher's oft-voiced counsel. Feel the form and let it do the work. Marin approached the second bout more carefully, letting his opponent make the first move. When the man struck, Marin was able to block the first blow and try a counter-strike. His opponent easily turned Marin's blade away, but Marin let the form pull him back just out of reach. Marin was actually surprised when his follow-up attack connected with Calvon's shoulder. Several members of the crowd nodded appreciatively at this, but the third point made them more skeptical— as Marin didn't last to the count of three before taking a blow to the side. Marin grunted slightly at the impact. Even a dulled blade had a powerful force behind it. Calvin had two points, though he couldn't win until he struck Marin twice in the same place. Marin still had a chance. He advanced, wary and careful, just as he had been trained. He did everything right— he followed the form properly, he let reflex direct his movements, and he swung his blade with precision. Yet the exchange still ended with a second blow to Marin's helm, officially ending the contest. There was a general air of snickering as Marin pulled off his helm, nodding in respect to his opponent. On the battlefield, Marin would have been dead. Here in the monastery courtyard, he was just shamed. He'd barely put up a fight. The crowd dispersed as the monks helped Marin out of his armor, then he slunk back toward Vasher and the others. No matter how crowded the courtyard got, Vasher's corner somehow remained comfortably free of interlopers. Marin took a drink with bowed head and flexed his lightly aching shoulder. Whatever it was the others had been encouraging Vasher to teach him, Marin would not learn it this day. Well, Vasher asked, you saw... Marin said. I didn't do so well. Why? Vasher asked. Marin shrugged. I can't tell, he said honestly. I thought I was doing everything right. The form, it just wasn't enough. My attacks were too easy to block and my swings were too wide. They left too many openings. 
Not enough practice, I guess. Vasher grunted, eyeing him. Oh, stop sulking. There was no way you were going to win that bout. Calvan Nadadin is an accomplished and experienced duelist, and you've never fought a bout in plate before. Then why did you make me fight him? Marin protested. The fight wasn't the test, kid, Chadron said, seated in the wall's shade a short distance away. The question afterward was... Marin paused. The question afterward? The form I'm teaching you isn't really one of the twenty dueling styles, Marin, Basher explained. It's something else. Something we came up with ourselves. By we, Chadron added, he means I, Vasher, developed this all by myself. Vasher shot the man a glare, then turned back to Marin. The style has its weaknesses, he said. It depends on knowing where your opponent is going to strike before he moves, something you can only do by fighting many men and understanding instinctively how your opponents think. It is a form that allows flexibility and ease of motion, letting you anticipate and adapt. It's a difficult style of fighting, little spearman. You probably won't win many duels until you master it. Once you do, you'll win them all. Marin frowned. Then, what is this skepping that the others mentioned? Something you don't need to know at the moment, Vasher said. Then, however, he raised a hand to cut off Marin's objection. However, it might be a good idea to start training you just in case. Here, sit down. Marin did so eagerly, settling himself on the sand. Vasher seated himself directly in front of Marin, adopting an almost meditative pose. Hold out your hand in front of yourself, pointing at me, then hold up one finger and point it at the sky. Marin did as commanded. What do you see? Basher asked. Um, my finger? Marin replied. Now focus on me, Basher commanded. Leave your hand where it is. What do you see? Marin frowned in confusion. The same thing. The same? Basher asked. Or two copies of the same? Well, yes, Marin said. If I focus on you, I see two versions of my finger, one from each eye. Exactly, Basher said. Now, I want you to focus your attention away from the two fingers. Keep looking at me, but try and see through your fingers. First one, then the other. If you concentrate hard enough, you should be able to see what is beyond, even though your finger is in the way. All right, Marin said. Vasher stood. When you can make both fingers disappear at once, you'll be ready to learn skipping. That's it, Marin protested, lowering his finger. Chadron laughed. Be glad, kid. At least he didn't make you do anything completely pointless. I remember him once forcing a student to try and snatch raindrops from the sky during a high storm. Basher grunted. This isn't a pointless exercise, Chadron, he snapped. It will teach the boy to focus and to control his perceptions. It will train his mind for what is to come. If you can come up with a better meditative exercise, then you can go find your own student. Marin smiled at the repartee holding his finger up again and trying to make the separate images disappear as Vasher had taught. Unfortunately, now that his master had moved, the view in front of Marin was that of the other noblemen. They continued their sparring, their laughter, and their camaraderie, all without even passing a glance by Vasher's corner of the courtyard. They still don't accept me, Marin said. I thought maybe helping Arador save the king would change things, but it didn't. They're polite, some are even respectful, but they don't like me. I don't think I'll ever be one of them. Good, Vasher said. I'll leave the boy alone, Vasher, Chadron said. Just because we left that world behind doesn't mean it's bad for everyone. The boy needs to know the truth, Vasher said firmly. They'll never accept you, Marin. Never. 
You remind them too much of what they are not, and that makes them uncomfortable. They're jealous of you because of what you've done in saving the king. But everyone knows that was our ador, Marin said. Doesn't matter, Basher said. They're jealous, and more importantly, they're angry that you aren't beneath them anymore. You're even above most of them in rank. They're angry that Lord Dalinar gave you a place in his house, and they're never, never going to accept you as one of their own. Get used to it. Marin lowered his eyes, staring down at the uncountable grains of sand before him. Lord Dalinar said something similar, back when I first got my blade. He said I wouldn't be able to make them like me, but I might be able to make them respect me. Lord Dalinar is a wise man, Basher repeated. A wise man, Chatron said quietly. A liar, but still wise. Basher shot Chatron a laconic glare, and for the first time Chatron looked as if he regretted one of his quips. Chadron glanced away, blushing slightly. Before Marin could voice a question, Vasher turned the stare toward him, forcing him to choke down the inquiry. The topic of Lord Dalinar's supposed lies was not to be discussed. As soon as Marin returned from the monastery, he went looking for Arador. His friend had been notably absent from sparring recently. Part of this was due, of course, to Arador's wound— the cut on his side had been deep, and it nearly cost him the use of his arm. He would not soon swing a sword with that hand again. There was more to it, though. Of all the members of Lord Dalinar's house, inactivity seemed to aggravate Arador the most. Marin saw the look in his friend's eyes the last few times Arador had visited the monastery. The young nobleman didn't seem to find solace or relief in exercise— but rather saw the sparring as a reminder of the war he thought he should be fighting. Indeed, Arador had been uncharacteristically pensive these last few weeks. Marin never knew where to locate his friend any more. Arador could no longer be found sparring at the monastery, lounging near the ladies' gardens, or drinking with friends in the local taverns. Instead, Dalinar's heir tended to sulk in the quiet palace sitting-rooms where he would sit with dissatisfied eyes and a snappish attitude, or sometimes he would wander the palace, pacing and brooding like a vengeful storm-shade. The worst sign of all was Arador's refusal to accompany his father when visiting local noblemen. Lord Dalinar was gone at the moment, in fact, on a three-day trip. Marin would have thought that Arador would welcome the chance to leave Kolinar, but the heir had complained fatigue from his injury and remained behind. Marin shook his head. Not like Arador at all. Marin strode into the palace. He made a point of visiting his friend every day to try and lift the man's spirits, and so he made his way to Arador's rooms. The steward there, however, informed Marin that Lord Arador was absent, and, like usual, Arador had left no word of his destination. Marin sighed, knocking on the door across the hallway instead. A familiar voice called for him to enter. Renarin employed no steward. Marin opened the door and stepped inside. There was something oddly sanitary about Renarin's quarters. They didn't quite look like someone lived in them. The boy was tidy, almost to a fault, and he shunned ornamentation. Marin, by Arador's recommendation, had commissioned several works of glyph art from local artists and hung them in his room. Renarin's walls were empty, and though his quarters were far larger than Marin's, they held about half as much furniture and no rugs. The room's only sign of personalization was the desk near the corner of the room, a piece of furniture that held several stacks of glyph-covered papers. Marin walked across the empty room, picking up the topmost paper. The glyphs were pressed on its page in haphazard, almost frustrated sequences. Marin recognized most of them. Simple numbers, nothing like the complex characters used in paintings or books of literature. I'm on the balcony, Renarin's voice called from a short distance away. Marin replaced the paper and made his way out onto the balcony. 
Though the Kolinar Palace was only one story tall, it had been built on a slight cleft in the land, allowing all of the rooms on the backmost wall to overlook the city. Lord Dalinar's balcony monopolized most of the space, but Renarin's rooms had a small section to the side of his father's. Renarin stood in simple whitish-gray clothing, not even wearing a cloak. He leaned against the balcony's stone railing, staring out, not at the city, but instead up into the sky toward a pattern of clouds that drifted toward the late. Not dark high-storm clouds, but regular white ones, the kind that Ardor claimed were far more common near the coast. "'Have you seen your brother around today?' Marin asked, walking up to stand beside Renarin. Renarin's shake of the head was almost imperceptibly slight. Marin squinted up into the sky, trying unsuccessfully to delve just what it was about the clouds that fascinated Renarin so. "'He didn't come to sparring again today,' Marin said. The healer said he should try and work his good arm so that he doesn't get too weak. But he hasn't shown up all week. Renarin nodded. Marin sighed, leaning against the railing. It's just a cloud, Renarin. What's so fascinating about it? I don't know, Renarin answered after a pause. I wish I did. Marin shook his head. Sometimes talking with Renarin was about as informative as a conversation with a rock. Renarin frowned, still watching the cloud. Do you ever think that you might be missing something? Missing something? Marin asked. Like what? An appointment? No, Renarin said. Something bigger. Like a piece of you that isn't there and never has been. But you can feel the space where it should go, and you wonder if everyone feels that space and doesn't recognize it, or if they all have the piece and you don't. Marin frowned. I don't know, Renarin, he said, trying his best to answer the question. I always dreamed about the ballads and the wars. I wanted to be part of something like the stories I had heard. And suddenly I was, and it turned out to be very different from what I had expected. There isn't much glory in watching your friends get cut down by arrows and spears. But you became a shard-bearer, Renarin noted. Marin grunted. And sometimes I wonder if that was a blessing from the Almighty or just some kind of divine prank. Renarin smiled. At least you got what you wanted, even if you later realized it wasn't what you had thought. Me? I don't even know what it is I want. I'll probably never be a shard-bearer again, and the king certainly isn't going to appoint me to any important positions. You'll always have a place in Kolinar, Marin said. Ardor will see to that. Coddled by my elder brother, Renarin said, shaking his head. There should be more. He glanced back toward the room. Marin followed his gaze toward the desk with its papers. Things have been confusing recently, Marin. I write at my equations and my numbers like I did even as a child, but something's wrong. I can't find the answers anymore. It's like, like I don't have all the numbers. It's like the universe can count to ten, but I can only reach five. Renarin, Marin said flatly, I have absolutely no idea what that's supposed to mean. Renarin smiled. Neither do I, I suppose. I guess that's the problem. Marin shook his head, sighing. How could someone be so depressing if you didn't even understand what they were talking about? As Marin turned, he noticed something from the palace grounds below. There was motion at the stables. Has your father returned early? he asked. Not that I know of, Renarin said, watching the cloud again. Marin frowned. There was certainly something going on down there. Come on, he said, tugging at Renarin's shoulder. It would do the boy good to get out of his rooms. Lord Arador has decided to ride out and meet his father, the stablemaster explained. We're preparing his mounts. To meet his father? Marin asked. But Lord Dalinar is expected back in just a couple of days. Arador will have to turn around and come back almost as soon as he arrives. I don't question the command of my betters, my lord, the stablemaster huffed. 
and neither should you, his tone implied. Marin sighed. The stable hands were preparing at least two ten sets of horses. Arador obviously intended to travel well attended. What was he thinking, and why hadn't he mentioned the decision to Marin? Marin glanced at Renarin, who was studying the horses intently. Eventually, Renarin just shrugged. I guess we can just ask him. Marin followed Renarin's nod toward where a group of figures was crossing the palace courtyard. Arador, dressed for riding, strode at their head, his deep blue colin cloak billowing behind him. Fifteen men accompanied him. Marin did a quick face count and came up with a surprising list. Five shard bearers, including Arador, he mumbled to Renarin, and the rest are fairly high ranking as well. What is his purpose? Renarin didn't reply. Arador noticed the two of them and paused, then walked forward to meet them. He adopted a friendly smile, reminiscent of the old Arador, but it seemed a bit forced. Still, it was good to see him walking so firmly, his head held high, the brooding gone from his eyes. Ah, Marin, Arador said, I've been looking for you. I didn't want to leave without letting you know where I'd gone. Marin frowned, glancing toward the horses. The other men were packing the last of their gear and mounting up. What is the meaning of this, Arador? Marin asked. It doesn't make any sense. Lord Dalinar will be back within a couple of days anyway. I've had a change of heart, Arador explained. I can't sit around any more. I have to go to him. Father needs me right now. He said so himself. Well, I guess I'll have to go pack, Marin said slowly. Or did you already take care of that? You aren't coming, Ardor said. The words were like a slap across the face. Ardor had always included him. But I'm sorry, Marin, Ardor said with a shake of his head. I can't take you this time. Don't worry, it won't be for long. You wouldn't want to come anyway. It will be a boring trip. I don't understand, Marin complained. If it's such a minor trip, then why does it matter if I come? Why— He's not going to meet father, Renarin interrupted in a quiet yet piercing voice. Marin paused, noting the flash of shame in Arador's eyes. The pack horses, Marin realized. There are too many of them. They wouldn't need so many supplies for a two-day trip. The war, Marin said. You're going to fight. Ardor shot a furtive glance at the working stable hands, then turned back to Marin and Renarin, speaking in a low voice. You can't tell anyone, he said. Father will try to find a way to stop us. Marin paled. You're disobeying Lord Dalinar's direct command. Ardor paused, then nodded once. I can't remain here in Kolinar, Marin. I need to find out for myself if my cousin is a traitor and I don't trust the king. I received a letter from Lady Yasna the night of the dueling competition. She seemed to think that her life was in danger, that the queen herself was involved in the assassination attempt on the king. There's more to this entire mess than people are telling us. If Lord Dalinar knew something, he'd tell us, Marin asserted. Probably, Arador agreed. But Yasna sent the letter to me, not father. She knows what I know, that father is too conservative. He's too worried about propriety sometimes, and this waiting proves it. He doesn't know which side is right, so he won't help either one, lest he choose incorrectly and find himself in the wrong. Well, I'm more of a gambler, and so are those who've decided to join me. There are things on the winds that just don't smell right, Marin. Everyone knows the king has been dissatisfied with Jezen Rosh for some time, and he's been suspiciously slow in disbanding his armies. There's something very convenient about the way those assassins struck, giving the king a perfect opportunity to move against Crossguard. Well, my companions and I don't intend to let Elokar raise his hand against one of our own until we're certain the move is just. Marin opened his mouth, then closed it. How do I make a decision like this? Choose between Lord Dalinar and Arador? This could cost you your title, Arador, Renarin whispered. Arador smiled wryly. Father taught me too well. He always told me it was best to do what I knew was right in my heart. 
Well, this is right, and I'm going. We can work out the consequences later. Besides, what is the worth of a title when you don't use it to seek what is just? He taught me that, too. Father will chase you down, Renarin warned. He'll have to send men after you to protect the integrity of his command. Arador nodded. Oh, he'll send men. But he won't catch us, no matter how fast his horses ride. Marin stood, trapped by his own indecisiveness. How could he let Arador ride without him, the man who had befriended him and who had taught him what it was like to live as a nobleman? Marin's cloak blew in the wind. Lord Dalinar's cloak, given to him as a symbol of Marin's oath of service. Arador regarded Marin for a long, uncomfortable moment. I won't take you even if you offer Marin, Arador finally said. I can see the indecision in your eyes, and this isn't a task for the uncommitted. Take care of Renarn until I return. With that, Arador turned and climbed into his saddle. Within a few moments, all fifteen men were gone, riding from the city and trailing the dust of their broken oaths behind them. Chapter 37 Shinri 7 Shinri was soon to discover what her father had meant by King Avan's transformation. While the security at her room was not relaxed, she was given a couple of ladies-in-waiting to provide service and companionship. Their greatest contribution by far, however, was in the area of information. Shinri learned about the king's sudden and miraculous remaking from idiot to leader. Both of her ladies, young and low-born, found the king a dramatic figure. They spoke of his speeches before the citizens and lords, telling Shinri of his powerful voice and his commanding sense of honor. In just a few short days, King Avan had managed to unite two opposing armies, making friends of all three houses. Of course, her father had something to do with that. His sudden rise to first prince was absolutely remarkable. That was the word one of the girls used. Remarkable. She had to think for a moment before saying it, however, and Shinri could see the hushed rumors in her eyes. The girl wouldn't, of course, speak the rumors to Ilhadal's own daughter. Shinri could guess what was being said, however. People assumed that her father had subtly killed his way to the top, a fact that would greatly weaken his reputation. The men of Yarkaved believed strongly in the duel as an ultimate decider of disputes, and they found assassination a cowardly substitute. Still, Ilhadal was house leader. He was reportedly not accepting any personal duels, but instead sending challengers to his champions. He could survive, for a time, in such a manner. He would need to do something eventually to prove his legitimacy, but for the moment his loyalty to King Avan lent a stabilizing factor to the three houses. Renar had pledged itself in alliance to Devar, and Devar had pledged itself to Vadenel. It appeared that the squabbles amongst the three houses would instead become unification, a transformation no less amazing than the king's supposed remaking. This new image of King Avan was somehow more discomforting than the old one. The idiot Avan, at least, had been a stable component. Despite her unfamiliarity with him personally, Shinri had been certain she knew what she could expect. While the prospect of marrying a man with the mind of a child was unsettling, at least it was something she could make plans around and understand. The new Avan, the reborn and remade Avan, was unassessable. What did one make of a man who was a mental invalid one day, then became a powerful leader and accomplished duelist the next? He provided just the kind of unpredictable element that Shinri had been carefully taught to avoid in her machinations. Unpredictability by its very nature cannot be trusted, or so Yasna had always said. 
far better to choose the stable yet less efficient than to gamble on the excellent yet random. And yet, dared she hope? The ladies spoke of this man in such awed voices that it was impossible for Shinri not to share in at least a bit of their adulation. True, they were young, and true, Vedans were a superstitious lot. But perhaps this man would live up to his budding reputation. Perhaps he would be a man like Lord Dalinar, strong, true, even loving. Shinri didn't meet the man she was to marry until the day of the wedding itself. After being stuck in her rooms for several weeks, waiting, the joy of being released was almost enough to wash away her nervousness. Her father had purchased for her an extravagant gown. Apparently his new position was providing him with the wealth he had coveted when she was a child. The garment was mostly white, embroidered with gold, Lord Avon's colors. She stood quietly, waiting as her ladies dressed her. A strange experience, since she was accustomed to being in their place. In a short while... I will be queen of the three houses. The thought was almost as dumbfounding as the concept of getting married. Her father soon arrived to inspect her. He looked out of place in his lavish costume, complete with a masterful cloak, pinned back slightly at the side to reveal the lack of a sword at his waist, an ostentatious reference to his being a shard-bearer. Ilhadal regarded his daughter with a characteristically mercantile air. Ill do, he finally decided. You'd hate to think you spawned an inferior product, right, father? Shinri thought angrily as the women finished her braids. That's what it always was. You hated me because I came from you, because my imperfection was your own. Well, I'm glad you finally found your place. You're at the top now. I hope you go mad from the frustration of not having anyone left to pander to. It's a good thing this is a political union, Ilhadal noted, because I doubt anyone would choose you otherwise. At least the dress is beautiful. Shinri was already working at the threads on the inside of her oversized left sleeve, and she yanked one free just for him. She probably shouldn't have snapped back at him. Yasna would have waited, but her frustration needed an outlet, and she spoke. How long do you think he'll let you live, once we're married? She asked. The ladies paused, and Shinri could feel their embarrassed exchange of glances. Let them speak. Anything that undercut her father's authority served Shinri's purposes. Ilhadal glared at her. Leave us he commanded the ladies. They did, leaving her alone in the cell of a room with her father. You will not speak of such things again, he commanded. Oh, Shinri asked. Should I not seek to warn my own father? Really, do you think that King Arvin can afford to let you survive the wedding? The chance that you'll kill him quietly like you did the others is far too dangerous. Do not speak so to your father, he said, stepping forward as if to hit her. Shinri remained firm. You would strike your queen on the day of her wedding? Ilhadal froze. That's right, father, she said. Queen, this is the place you've given me, and it is one over and above you. Of course, Soon there will be few whose place isn't greater than your own. I was wrong again, he said with a snort. That Colin woman fooled me. You haven't lost any of your impudence. You just put a fair cover over it. Tell me, father, Shinri said. Have your noblemen been giving you gifts? Large sums presented in quiet as pledges of loyalty? Do they give you promises to follow and accept your leadership? Do they seem a little too eager to please? He paused. Shinri studied him carefully. You only have this one chip to play, she told herself. Get as much from it as you can. 
King Arvan gives speeches often now, she guessed. And oddly, he makes most of them before the troops. Your troops. Their loyalty was never really yours. It belonged to Tal Shech. You are a poor substitute, a last-moment replacement for the man they admired. Your faction may have gained dominance, but only because of the Vaden sense of martial decorum. You were next in line, and that is the only reason they let you become first prince. Of course, there's one easy way to remove that problem. Take you out of the line and someone else can step up. Ilhadal looked dumbfounded. How do you know these things? he demanded. Your maids have been speaking. I told them to remain quiet about outside events. Avan and your own noblemen are already plotting your death, father, Shinri said, ignoring his comment. They're waiting for the formality of a marriage, for they see the advantage of uniting two of the great houses. You had better tell your assassins to be quick. Once this marriage happens, you'll need to kill the king immediately. I would never, Ilhadal snapped. I'd take up my own sword and strike him down first. Ah, Shinri thought, reading his face. There was honesty in his anger. So you didn't do it then. Ilhadal Davar had not killed his kinsman. It was an oddly relieving revelation. There had been children among the thirteen men ahead of him for the house throne. It was a comforting thought to know that one's father did not murder children. But who then? Could it really be a coincidence? Fourteen men, dead in a few months? All of the precise lines required to put my father on the throne? Then you're doomed, she said out loud. Even if the king doesn't kill you, you won't keep your place long. Your so-called supporters are only placating you while they gather strength. Everyone assumes you took the throne through deception. They'll give you money and private promises. True. But think about this, father. When you were a sycophant in the very court you now rule, did you give the largest gifts? to the men you trusted and respected? Or did you give them to the men you wanted to lull? They'll begin presenting real challengers as soon as the wedding is finished, and eventually you won't be able to hide behind champions. No man can fight off an entire house. They'll bring you down eventually, one way or another. He was very nervous now. Her words had obviously shaken his confidence, and he tugged at his lavish clothing, as if seeing it anew. How? Shinri raised an eyebrow. Really, father? She noted dryly. You shouldn't have sent me to tutor under the greatest political mind of our time if you didn't want me to learn a few things. I can try and help you, once I am queen. But so far you have given me little encouragement to do so. Ilhadal snorted, eyeing her with a look that, she was satisfied to note, now contained a great deal more respect than it had before. Of course, he probably gives Krom more respect than he usually gives me. We'll see, he finally said with a wave of his hand. The thing is, child, you don't know half of what you think you do. There's something greater than this all, something that will hold the noblemen together, and something that will make certain people respect me rather than whisper snidely behind me. Yes, if only you understood. He smiled then, not realizing that in nibbling at her bait, he had given away far more than he expected. Shinri was missing a piece of it all, a bit more prodding, and she would know what it was. That prodding, however, would have to come after the wedding. The doors opened at her father's command, and her ladies rushed back in to put the final touches on her hair, then pick up her train. Soldiers waited at attention on either side of the hallway. They held their swords out, point down, tips touching the stone, and making a column of steel that led her way to the wedding chamber. Blessed Almighty! Shinri thought, her nervousness returning full force. 
I'm not ready for this. The ceremony, however, obviously didn't intend to wait until she was ready. Her father nodded for her guards to begin the escort, then hurried off to place himself at the front of the audience. Shinri walked slowly down the hallway, swords lining her on either side, feeling a numbness overtake the passion she had felt during the debate with her father. The last few weeks had been a different life, a dream. She didn't even know what had become of Alethkar. Had Yasna found the assassins? What if the tension between Jezenrosh and King Elokar? Yasna's own marriage to Meridas could very well have happened already, and if it hadn't, it would come very soon. I won't be able to return to that life, Shinri realized for the last time. My father was right. One way or another, my wardship is over now. I'm not the student anymore. I'm on my own. The doors to the wedding chamber opened, and she felt her first real hint of terror at what was about to come. She was too young. Most women were at least given until they were 18, even in political marriages. She didn't know enough, hadn't learned long enough. She couldn't even decide if she enjoyed noble society or was disgusted by it. She looked for something to break, scatter, or twist, but there was nothing. Her ladies continued to prod her forward, and the waiting crowd watched expectantly. She barely saw King Avon, standing in a sharp white uniform, showing none of the idiocy she had seen in him before. She wasn't certain how she kept walking, moving forward, until she stood before him. She knelt, taking her place on the cushion facing him. Only one line of thought kept her strong. He looks like a good man. If he really has spent all this time pretending, then he's clever too, and strong enough to keep his throne when everyone thought he would lose it for certain. He is handsome, now that his eyes are firm and intelligent. He's calm, too. He could be the man I've hoped for. His face was rigid. He gave her no smile, no look of encouragement as she knelt, but she shouldn't have expected one. This was a serious occasion, and all reports made him out to be a sober man. He didn't know her, but she would be his most powerful supporter. She would keep his throne for him, protect his interests, as Yasna had so deftly taught her. He didn't realize it yet, but he was getting more than just a simple political union. Far more. The ceremony passed in a blur. A Vorin monk spoke some words, the crowd waited politely, and Shinri knelt demurely. At the end, King Avan Vedanel reached down, palm forward, and she took his hand. The ceremony was over. The next few hours were a dazed mix of congratulations and feasting. Shinri wanted to speak with the man she had just married, but as the wedding feast began, she was almost immediately pulled away to the queen's table, her table. Women who had barely been civil to Shinri during her visits to Vedanar searching for Tethran now jostled and vied for a chance to sit next to her. Shinri glanced toward the king's table, letting the women work their seating out amongst themselves. Avan Vedanal reigned at his table with a commanding presence, he had the kind of charismatic aura that took skill and experience to produce. It was only then, sitting at the table, being served a meal she was too nervous to eat, that Yasna's training finally kicked in. Why would he pretend to be an idiot for so long, Shinri thought suspiciously. What would it accomplish? She could think of several advantages. In recent centuries, House Vedanal had been the weakest of the three houses, despite its possession of the throne. A strong king would have been subject to duels from the other house leaders, but by feigning idiocy, Avan would have been able to maneuver himself into a position of power before revealing himself. But what a gamble, Shinri thought, not certain whether to be impressed by his resourcefulness or skeptical of his fortune. 
How had he learned leadership skills when he had spent his days acting the imbecile? How could he be certain that even now he would have the necessary core group of loyal attendants to secure his rule? A popularity gained through sensationalism could be lost in a flash of poor luck. Shinri spent most of the meal pondering these issues. She was still more than a little stunned by the day's events. She was no longer Shinri, the child ward of Yasna, but Lady Shinri, the woman queen of Vedanar. Her logical ponderings about Avan were more a retreat to the familiar than they were an exercise of true rationality. By the meal's end, she had come to only one conclusion. Avan Vedanel was a man of superior luck and skill. Great events would mark his reign, and she had to know what kind of man he was. The feasting ended, and within moments, Shinri found herself alone with him, a man she still didn't know, in his chambers. The wedding night was a thing she had barely let herself consider. This moment was to have belonged to Tethryn. That she should have to spend it with another seemed wrong, a violation of the love she had once held. Tethryn is dead, Shinri told herself firmly. You have to make a new life now. She stood quietly as Arvan closed the door to his bedchamber. My lord, she said humbly, his back still to her. Though we are now husband and wife, I find that I barely know of you, let alone know you personally. What kind of man is it that I have married? He didn't answer. In fact, he acted as if he hadn't heard her. He turned and began to disrobe with careful, almost emotionless functionality. He paused only once, looking up, his expression explaining that it was time for her to do what was expected of a wife. He took her quickly, without speaking. Resigned to her place as his wife, Shinri accepted it, until she saw those eyes. Focused in the wan light above her, more powerful than the passion, pain, and confusion, were those eyes. She saw a depth of rage and anger within them, a hatred that made her want to curl up in horror. They were not the eyes of a lover. They were not the eyes of a noble lord. They were the eyes of a monster, released from their mask during those moments when all emotions became bare. Then she understood. He climbed off of her, stepping away from the bed, his face and motions returning to their previous level of control. Shinri sat back, shivering as she pulled the blankets up around her naked body. A sudden and sickening terror drove her. She wanted to hide from those eyes. It was you, she whispered, silently enough that she was certain he wouldn't be able to hear her. What was me? he asked firmly, his voice oddly accented, his eyes focused on her face. You, she repeated. You killed them, or had them killed? The people in the succession line before my father. You assassinated them? And he smiled, a cold, terrible smile. Yes. Why? she whispered. King Arvin shrugged. Your father was the only one ambitious enough to take the house throne, yet weak enough to hesitate when the time came to kill me and take my place. He paused, looking at her and smiling again. And he was the only one with an unmarried daughter of age, or at least near enough. The chill in Shinri's breast became ice and it begged her not to ask the next question. Yet like an onlooker drawn to a scene of carnage, she could not stop herself. But, she whispered, I was engaged to another. Avon's smile deepened. How? she whispered. I'm amazed that you never noticed, Avon said, continuing to dress. The man, Tethryn, 
never loved you. Not really. He wanted my sister, Nanava, with the deep, foolish love men reserve for something unattainable. You should have paid more attention to the ballads he listened to. The song of a hundred lovers, the blessing of Minala, wind-born fate. These are the songs of a hopeless romantic. All I had to do was promise him Nanava's hand, and he was willing to risk his honor, his life, everything. You see, Prince Tethryn could never have loved you. You were given to him freely. Numbness. Just let yourself be numb. No feeling. Don't think about what just happened. Don't think of that thing touching you. Avan tossed her dress onto the bed, its fine sea silk now wrinkled. Put that back on. Shinri didn't move. She couldn't. Avan regarded her. He displayed no hints of anger as he walked to the door and threw it open. He pointed to the guards outside. You four, he said. Go and dress my wife. Shinri felt her eyes widen in reflexive horror. He wouldn't dare. Avan stepped over and ripped the blanket free from the bed, leaving her exposed. Now, he snapped to the guards. He would. Despite the direct command, the guards stood uncertainly. Shinri reacted first, the air cold on her skin as she scrambled off the bed and picked up the dress. The guards eventually stepped forward, making perfunctory efforts at helping as she hastily, embarrassedly struggled to don the dress. She tried to ignore the faces poking in through the door, though she couldn't help blushing as they saw her nudity. The dress's tassels and exaggerated train made the dressing difficult, especially since the soldiers did their best to look anywhere but at her as they helped. As she finally got the dress to cover the more embarrassing sections of skin, Avan stepped forward, grabbing her chin and lifting her eyes from the floor to meet his. Your father is a fool, he whispered. We both realize that. Now we both also realize that I won't indulge spoiled women as he once did. That was a mistake. It gave her a focus for her shame and anger. It let her see into those eyes again and gather what strength she had. When he released her chin, it remained held up. Good enough, he told the guards. Her dress was disheveled and improperly tied, but she was at least decent. Come, Avan said, both to her and the guards, as he strode from the room. Shenry followed, not because she was beaten, but because she knew there was no use to fighting at the moment. He had just proven his control. She couldn't fight him. Not yet. Her father joined the group as it strode down the palace hallways. He gave Shinri barely a look, though he did flush slightly at the sight of her with her hair unraveled and hanging freely, her dress rumpled. What is this? Ilhadal asked. Why are the troops gathering outside? It's time for you to have your proof, Ilhadal, Avan replied, as promised. We begin our plans this afternoon. Now? Ilhadal asked. But the gate? Come, Avan said simply. The shame of being forced to leave the palace and walk without a litter in her current state would have mortified the Shinri of a few hours before. Now the gawking citizens seemed like nothing. He killed Tethran, she thought. Somehow. Avan convinced Tethran to ride to certain death, just so that I would be unengaged at the proper time. He found a way to slaughter the Devar line of succession so that my father would take the house throne. She had to keep a tight hold on her terror as they approached the Oathgate Dome, lest she begin to worry about what he would do next. Unpredictable indeed. Unpredictable and terrible. 
Soldiers were gathered inside the city. This was odd enough to give Shinri pause. She had expected there to be an army outside the city, for she had heard some minor explanations of how Tal Shech's force was now commanded by the idiot king. But these men were inside the city itself, thousands of them, spearmen, swordsmen, and archers, standing in neat ranks, waiting for something. Avan led her past the rows of men toward the Oathgate Dome. Inside the red-painted structure waited another squadron of soldiers. These men wore blue uniforms, Aleph uniforms. Shinri couldn't contain a laugh. That's why you kept me imprisoned, she realized. You think to take Ral Aram. You feared my loyalties to House Colin. Her father started, but Avan acted as if he hadn't even heard the comment. The king walked forward, inspecting the blue uniformed troops. You won't get through the gate, Shinri said, catching the king's eye. King Elokar isn't that great a fool. The gates are locked from the Aleth side, except when there are plenty of troops present. Avan didn't respond, but instead turned back to his inspection. This? Shinri asked of her father. This is what you were preparing for? This is your great plan? You think the Aleths aren't aware of the danger the Oath Gates provide? You won't be able to go through until they decide to open their end, and they're always wary of an attack when they do so. You'll never take the city this way. Her father shifted uncomfortably. He says he has a way to open the gates even if one side is locked, Ilhadal mumbled weakly. Shinri laughed. Then he is the idiot king after all. A hand grabbed her neck. You can do this, with or without the dress on, my queen, Avan whispered in her ear. You may choose. If you say another word this day without first being told to do so, I will take it as a sign that you've decided to give the men a show. Shinri flushed and Avan pulled her by the neck over to the oath gate. He paused for a moment, eyes deep with concentration, and she thought she saw him take a breath, as if in preparation for some great task, or some great gamble. Touch it, he said, nodding to the large opal set in the side of the oath gate. What? Shinri asked. He nodded to the opal again. Touch it, he commanded. Shinri sighed and reached out to the shimmering palm-sized stone. Everything stopped. It was as if a hundred different pathways suddenly opened to her. An offering, made before her fatigued conscience, sudden and amazing refreshment, pure and beautiful fulfillment of problems she hadn't known she had. Distant locations appeared, not actual images, but tantalizing offerings, things formless yet encouraging. Just walk, go, find us, leave. Through the images and longing, she somehow saw a haze of white mist stream down from the top of the oath gate, obscuring its center and indicating that it had been opened. Avan pushed her away from the gate, and her link was broken. Suddenly, she couldn't remember what she had sensed or seen, and was left only with a hurtful desire. What? What was that? Avan spun, smiling broadly and waving his hand toward the oath gate. Well, he demanded of the stunned guards and collected noblemen, get moving. Shinri stood quietly as the soldiers in blue rushed forward, piling through the now open oath gate. Secure the palace, Avan ordered. You must not let anyone out to raise warning. Kill any you see. I don't care who they are. The future of the three houses depends on your courage. A living servant is one who can escape and warn King Elokar. 
an event that would result in the deaths of yourselves and your brother's soldiers. Shinri stumbled away, but a guard caught her, holding her by the shoulders as Avan continued to encourage the men to their grisly task. He would massacre the entire palace staff just to keep his invasion secret. He was worse than a monster. He was a thing for which Shinri had no words. And I married to him. Yasna would probably tell her to stay with him. The position of power as Avan's wife would, in Yasna's eyes, provide the greater opportunity to protect lives and keep Alethkar safe. Though Avan seemed harsh, he had enjoyed bedding her. She could use that against him, forcing him to spare lives and be merciful. But I am not, Yasna. The revelation came as if a stark and sudden break in the clouds. And I never will be. She would be right. Staying with him would serve the most good. It is the logical and perhaps moral choice, but I cannot do it. The first time he had come to her, she had accepted him, but she hadn't known. Never again. If he took her again, she would fight. She looked up, studying the grim satisfaction in Avon's eyes. It had been a long time since she had felt hatred, and it had never been this strong. There was only one thing to do. The roads called to her, the outside, the freedom. She would escape. Chapter 38 Town 7 The statue looked nothing like him, of course. It stood about twelve feet tall, bold and powerful. Its face was indistinct, following Canaran artistic traditions, but the body and clothing were magnificently detailed. An enormous muscular chest sat atop squat trunk-like legs. The arms bulged with inhuman strength as they held their massive shard blade point down in front of the body. Tal shook his head. No human could bear such ridiculous proportions and oversized muscles. Such a man would have trouble walking, let alone fighting. Of course, that mattered little to the people. They would have their heralds and would design them as they saw fit. Truth rarely measured up to imagination. He had never grown accustomed to seeing his image, realistic or not, used as an icon of faith. It was bad enough when the Vorans used it. These new Ilinra temples were even more troubling. Talon had heard the Krom cleaners speak of the so-called New Ilinra religions, which had developed in rural areas during the last few centuries. However, the Ilinra ideas, focusing on mysticized worship of the heralds, were not really all that new at all. They were just a continuation of mankind's millennia-old heresy. Nearly every epoch, the heralds had been forced to reiterate their primary teaching. The Almighty was to be worshipped, the Elin were not. Talon sighed, turning away from the temple. Perhaps there would be time to correct the heresy of Kanar later. He bowed his head and walked away from the city of Ral Aram, moving toward the steep stone rampway that led to the upper plateau and the palace. And so I retreat, Talon thought, and leave them to their doom. It was a bitter realization. Ral Aram, the first capital, had always been a place of strength. The city had never fallen to the Hothen. Even during the last two returns, when the creatures had nearly overwhelmed mankind, Ral Aram had remained strong. Since its founding five epochs before, the city had been a symbol of unity and hope for the people of Roshar. Unity no longer. Talon shouldered his pack, a simple construction sewn from the sheet of his bed, and climbed the palace incline. Below him, the city proper sat on its cliffside ledge, unaware that its herald had failed. Over two months had passed since his coming. Less than eight remained until the Hothen returned. Talon had no more time to spend on the once great fortress city. He would find allies elsewhere, 
and with them stand. If only the others were here, Talm thought with frustration. Jezrian would have persuaded the foolish king and his sisters, sign or no sign. Nail would have drawn supporters from the warriors of the city with his sheer aura of noble efficiency. Chanaral, dear, patient Chanaral, would have gained the love of the people, and with that love forged an alliance against the darkness to come. Unfortunately, Ral Aram had been left with Talm instead. A warrior, true, but one of steel and blood. A conflict of politics and persuasion was far beyond his capabilities. Perhaps once he located the others, he would be able to bring them back. Perhaps there was time yet for Ral Aram. If you find the others, a voice in his mind whispered. I will, Tom told himself, swiftly capping his worries lest the fires come again. I will. A figure met him at the top of the stone ramp. Tom paused, frowning as he regarded Lon. Would the monk never give up? Over the last few days, Lon had tried incessantly to convince Tom to stay. Talm had been glad when Yasna's messenger had finally come, telling him a time had been arranged for him to use the oath gates, if only because it would finally let him be rid of Lon's pestering. Apparently he had been premature in that assumption. Well, Talm asked of Lon. The monk smiled, stepping aside and revealing a small pack, crafted, Talm noticed, very similarly to his own. I've decided to go with you. Talm raised an eyebrow. I don't think so. You don't get to choose, Lon said happily, picking up his pack. If you leave me behind, I'll just follow you and make a nuisance of myself. You're needed here, Talm said, walking past him. Oh, I know, Lon said, rushing to catch up. Without me, the monastery floors will have no one to clean them. A tragedy, let me assure you. He paused, cocking his head to the side. Of course, if I leave, the monastery seniors will have to replace me. Maybe the cleaning will actually get done once in a while. I guess I'm doing them a favor. You're not coming with me, Talm said, walking up the palace steps. He proffered Lady Yasna's admittance note to one of the guards, then waited as the man carried the note over to the guardhouse so their scribe could read it. You know, Talonel, Lon said, for a man who claims to be horribly unsettled by the fact that no one believes his message, you seem rather quick to reject the one follower you've managed to recruit. Talon eyed the monk. You don't believe that I'm a herald? Lon shrugged. Haven't made up my mind yet. Perhaps I just need a little more time. Talon snorted. Lon hid the truth well, but it was very difficult to lie to a man who had lived for three thousand years. Lon still thought Talon insane. In fact, Lon thought him even more insane than he once had. The monk had that glint in his eye. It was the glint the nobility had shown on that night months ago when Talon had failed to show the sign. It was the glint the warrior monks had shown when Talon infiltrated their training courtyard. It was a glint born of the discomfort, uncertainty, and even fright that came from speaking with a complete madman. Oddly, it disappointed Talon to see the discomfort in Lon's eyes. The monk had never shown it before. Lon's worry was a recent manifestation, something that had appeared after that night at the duels when the monk had finally realized the extent to which Talon was willing to go. Now Lon understood. He would never quite be comfortable around Talon again. But there was truth in Lon's words. Talon was in no position to reject anyone willing to help him. The Hothen were coming, the Knights of Pelion were no more, and his blade had been stolen. Talon would have to make use of the tools he had. Very well, Talon said, as the guard returned, waving Talon into the palace and handing back his writ. You may come. Assuming you're willing to agree to one condition— you will not sabotage my attempts to persuade the other kings of Roshar. You might be convinced of my insanity. Let others make their own decision. Agreed? Sounds fair, Lon said, 
joining him as they moved through the massive entry hall, walking toward the oath-gate chamber. The monk wore a simple gray traveling robe and cloak, his feet shod with leather sandals. I'll have to see about getting you some boots, Tom said. We may need to cut across some storm lines between cities. Boots, Lon said with amusement. I've never owned a pair. Tom paused. Never? he asked. Lon shook his head. Tom frowned. When was the last time you left the first capital? Fifteen years ago, Lon replied. Great. I don't suppose you ever did any weapons training with the Order of Conra? Nope, Lon said cheerfully. Never found much use for it. Even better, Tom thought with a sigh. Come on, he said, walking the final distance to the oath gate chamber. Two blue liveried soldiers stood at the entrance, and they quickly moved to block Tom and Lon. Tom reached into his cloak pocket, unfolding Yasna's writ and proffering it again. The guard did not take the paper. The oath gates are sealed, the man said simply. I have a, Tom began. No exceptions, the guard informed. Tom frowned. I was told I would be allowed through before King Elokar's sealing took effect. The guard did not respond. Tom sighed, glancing to the side where Lon betrayed a hint of nervousness. Mentally, Tom rolled his eyes. The monk obviously worried that Tom would just attack the soldier out of frustration. Not that Lon would be worried about the guard. He still assumed Tom to be some deranged farmer who had stood out during one too many high storms. Go and find Lady Yasna, Tom told the guard calmly, much to Lon's obvious relief. She'll explain. Again, the soldier didn't reply. Well, that's that, Lon said, tugging on Tom's sleeve. Guess we'll have to go back. We can return as soon as Lady Yasna sorts things out. You know, this is actually fortunate. I know a couple of men who offered to let us into a game of chips tonight if we happened to— Tom ignored the monk, frowning slightly to himself. His instincts twitched nervously. Something was wrong. He glanced to the side, analyzing his surroundings, his body growing taut with anticipation. What had his subconscious noticed? The oath gate room, Tom thought, looking past the guards. An inordinate number of soldiers were gathered in the room, all in Alaskar blue. Except... It was faint, very faint, the scent of blood. Yes, Lon, Tom said slowly, backing away from the two soldiers. I think we will go. Lon actually looked surprised. Tom studied the soldiers as he walked away. Their uniforms were too perfect. Their hair was aleth black, but their temples and fingers were darkened slightly with dye. Behind the two guards, several squads of soldiers formed up, weapons drawn. One of them noticed Tom's study and raised a hand, barking a command to one of his companions. Out of the palace, no, Tom said, shoving the monk down the hallway and taking off at a dash. Chapter 39 Marin 9 The sovereign must hold himself to a higher standard than the citizen. His path is one of poise, of control, and of sobriety. When his people feast, he must remain watchful for enemies. When his people sleep, he must remain alert for danger. He must never allow his honor to be compromised, because his actions are the actions of a country. His honor is their honor. This is generous, to act as normal men wish they could. Marin paced in the monastery reading room, its smaller confines well fitting his agitated mood. The monk, in his simple gray sen coat and tan trousers, read calmly from The Way of Kings. Though the man undoubtedly noticed Marin's state, he refrained from making any commentary. He simply read according to his duty, acting as an unbiased conduit for the ancient text. Marin would have welcomed a little advice at the moment, 
Unfortunately, he was becoming accustomed enough to noble propriety to realize this was not an issue to discuss with a random monastery brother. And so he paced, hoping Badgerdon's wisdom would stretch through the epics to tell Marin what he should do. Read that part again, Marin said, pausing. The sovereign must hold himself accountable to laws that normal men may ignore, the monk said dutifully. It is only by living a higher path himself that he can ask his people to obey his dictates. Marin nodded, beginning his pacing again as the brother continued on. As Marin moved, his eye caught sight of the room's corner, where his shard blade sat leaning against the wall, Dalinar's cloak draped over its hilt. The sovereign must hold himself accountable to laws that normal men may ignore. Marin was no sovereign, no king or parson, and yet he was a nobleman. Bajardin's words were addressed to him. Marin had assumed he understood. He'd wanted to be a hero, wanted it so badly. His dreams had been of shard blades and great acts of courage, his mind stuffed with evening stories told when the day's harvest was in. He had been prepared for hardship— the stories always spoke of the soreness of marching or that of sleeping on rock. Things were never easy for the great warriors. Their horses died, their friends betrayed them, and they always got caught outside during high storms. He had been prepared to be hurt, perhaps to die. The heroes didn't always win. Some, like poor Tanoth of Kanar, died bravely, but died nonetheless. Marin continued his pacing. Why hadn't any of the stories prepared him for this? What of the guilt that came from doing what you thought was right, then realizing afterward that you might have been wrong? What was the right answer? He had let Arador go. A braver man would have gone with his friend, joining him in a just but unpopular cause. A more honorable man would have sent word to Lord Dalinar, warning of the heir's flight. Perhaps if Marin had done that, the riders sent to chase Arador down would have been successful. Yet faced with these two options, Marin had done nothing. He hadn't gone with Arador, and he hadn't informed Lord Dalinar. His inaction made him feel non-existent. The world continued as if Marin weren't involved. But wasn't that a good thing? Who was he to interfere with the workings of great men? The sovereign must hold himself accountable to laws that normal men may ignore. That was the problem. Faced with two choices, both honorable in their own light, Marin had done nothing. But, he thought with frustration, what could I have done? Sent messengers to Lord Dalinar, thereby betraying Arador? Left to try and protect Arador, thereby breaking my oaths to Lord Dalinar? Honor was supposed to be absolute. Of this single fact, the stories were firm. There was good, and there was evil. Was Marin flawed because he couldn't tell the two apart? He wasn't really a nobleman, after all. He was just a peasant with a shard blade. He couldn't help thinking that a better man in his same position would have instinctively known what to do. They did. Dalinar and Arador. They both knew their courses, and they chose opposite paths. But they're both good men. Could a good man choose a dishonorable action? The monk had stopped reading. Marin paused, looking up. They must have reached the end of the fourth section of the Way of Kings already. You may go, Marin said. He'd kept the man far too long already, and Bajardin's words didn't seem like they were helping all that much. Marin had gone through the entire book nearly at ten set times during the last week, and he was no closer to a solution. Marin sighed, gathering up his blade and throwing on his cloak. Outside, the hallways of Glory Home Monastery were broad, almost daunting. Great archways covered massive and intricate glyph renderings, constructed with silvers, golds, and gemstones, so that they glistened in the sunlight. Marin passed near one, his form blocking the window's light and throwing a shadow over the majestic wall inlay. 
It was designed vaguely in the shape of the double eye, but it was crafted from what looked to be hundreds, maybe even thousands, of glyphs. He ran his eyes along the patterns, looking for forms he recognized. There were a few familiar glyphs, but not the one he sought. He suspected he would never again see his phantom glyph, the strange carving that had granted him such power. The stories and old gaffers often spoke of mystical glyph wards imbued with power. They were always ancient and rare things, like in the tale of the Tenth Dawn, with its pig-herding hero. Marin had found such a glyph of power, but had wasted its energies in one furious moment. He could still feel the winds charging down the palace hallway, screaming in his ears, obeying his desperate plea. Such strength! If only he could remember the exact construction of the glyph. Perhaps he could recreate its power, if only in some small way. But his attempts so far had been laughable, and he dare not show them to anyone else, for they smacked too closely of writing. Marin shook his head. Such powers were for awakeners and mystics. It had been marvelous fortune that one had found its way to him, even for a short time. In fact, it was probably better that it was gone. Such things were not meant for simple boys like Marin. It had belonged to the faceless shard-bearer, a charm intended for the workings of some great deed. A deed I foiled, Marin thought. The assassination of King Elokar. That glyph ward was meant for foul deeds, Marin. Yes, it is much better lost. In the end, instead of killing the king, the glyph ward had served to save the man's life. I stare at them too sometimes, Renarin's voice said from behind. Marin turned as Renarin walked up beside him. The younger Colin's son stood with his eyes focused on the massive glyph rendering. Even when I was a boy, I was more interested in the patterns on monastery walls and floors than I was in the sermons of the monks. Renarin reached up, brushing a line of silver inlay with his fingers, as if searching through touch for some meaning that his eyes could not detect. Finally he turned to Marin. How was your recitation from the Way of Kings? Frustrating, Marin replied. What about you? How was your recitation of, uh... Beyond the Wall of Essence, Renarin explained. And yes, it was interesting— though it's a seventh epic work and some of the language is difficult to understand. You should have it read to you sometime, especially if you're interested in lonomic theory. Marin nodded, though he had little interest in the esoteric works Renarin studied. The basic texts were confusing enough. Marin turned to go, moving down the hallway toward the monastery exit. Renarin's eyes lingered on the massive glyph rendering, but he did follow. Marin stepped out into the sunlight. Glory Home was very different from the other two monasteries in Kolinar. It was constructed on the side of the late valley, a moderate hike from the city proper. Renarin explained that Ishar monks, the order named after the herald who had written the arguments, tended to prefer seclusion. Glory Home's hallways were always quiet, and there were no courtyards for dueling practice just seemingly endless rooms filled with books, scrolls, and reading pedestals. They began to walk the switchbacks leading down to Kolinar, Marin's mind brooding over the same old problems. The morning chill had burned away as the sun crested the valley walls, and the summer heat was powerful. That only served to increase his taxed feeling of fatigue. Do you wonder if we did the right thing, Renarn? he asked as they walked. It is a man's way to wonder, Renarin replied. Marin sighed, rolling his eyes slightly. Unfortunately, Renarin was the only one he could talk to about the topic. Well, do you find any answers when you wonder? I assume you're talking about my brother, Renarin said. Marin nodded. Renarin walked for a moment before speaking again. I don't know, Marin, he finally said. I don't think it would have been right to try and stop him. You saw how he was that week before he left. This is something he needed to do. And if he dies out there? Marin asked. If he is killed in the war, won't his death be partially upon us, since we didn't do our duty by stopping him? 
Renarin shrugged. I don't know. How can you be so ambivalent? Marin demanded with frustration. This is your brother we're talking about. If we had been the ones leaving for war, Arador would have gone with us. You know he would have. Arador would have insisted on accompanying us, if only to protect us from harm. But we let him go alone. Renarin fell silent. Eventually he just sighed. You think I haven't considered these things, Marin? You think I haven't stood in the night staring east wondering what Arador is doing, if he's all right? I've seen you brooding these last few days. Well, you're not the first one to worry. People always whisper about me in court, about how I'm always thinking about things no one else cares about. Well, I think about things I care about. And let me promise you, if it involves Arador's flight, I've considered it. Far harder and far longer than you probably have. Marin recoiled slightly at the outburst, spoken in Renarin's usual near monotone, yet snappish nonetheless. A moment later, Renarin turned toward him, a bit of the hostility draining from his posture. I'm sorry, Marin, he said. I wish I could answer you. It seems I'm having enough trouble answering my own questions lately. I've always been able to see things, answer problems that no one else can. But now, when it finally matters, I can't find anything but more questions. I don't know where to find the answers to any of them. Marin looked down, feeling a bit ashamed. If Renarin had tried that hard and was still confused, what chance did Marin have of finding the answers? If only... Marin looked up. The city was approaching, and from their vantage he could make out much of its sprawl, including several distinctive buildings. Renarin doesn't know where to find the answers. I think I do, Marin said. Come on. The Ilinra temples confused Marin. For the most part, the nobility ignored the Ilinra, and what little they did say about the religious sects was always scornful. That felt odd to Marin, since in other areas of faith the nobility were quick to prove how righteous they were. During his months in Kolinar, Marin had been able to discover a bit of what made the Ilinra unpopular. The ten heraldic sects were connected in the noble mind to the common man, but not in the same way as the order of Konra monks, who spend their time serving the poor and the feeble. No, the Ilinra were considered something that only citizens participated in, something beneath noble attention. There also seemed to be some sense that the Ilinra were unorthodox, even profane, though Marin couldn't understand how that would be. The Ilinra worshipped the heralds and the Almighty, just like Boranism. They were parts of the same religion. Renarin balked at the temple entrance. I don't think we should be doing this, Marin. Why not? Marin asked. Ilinra soothsayers came through my village all the time, and everyone agreed that they were useful. They predicted the floods during my twelfth year, and one told my mother she was pregnant before she even knew. My father always got their advice to decide which day to begin the planting or harvest. That's superstition, Marin, Renarin said. The Almighty doesn't work like that. Giving his truths to whispering soothsayers and mystics? Why not? Marin asked. Doesn't he want us to know what to do? The arguments say he loves us, right? So he'd want us to ask him what to do. We ask for blessings through the monasteries, Renarin said. Marin rolled his eyes. This is the same thing. Come on, I'll show you. If the Alinra were evil, would your father let them into his city? I don't think he has much choice, Renarin said. They're too popular to keep out. He looked up, staring at the statue of Prael Smokewish, Herald of Secrets. The statue depicted a dynamic figure, a tall, lean man who was bare-chested beneath his sen coat. The herald's right arm was upraised, fingers curled as if grasping an unseen object. The head pointed east, toward the dawn, and the left hand held a stone shard blade. I've never liked that statue, Renarin said. I don't imagine Prael Ilin like that. He's too imposing to be a scholar. Are you coming in or not? Marin prodded. Renarin finally sighed, climbing the steps and joining Marin. Marin nodded, trying to look more confident than he was. In truth, he didn't have much of an idea how to proceed. 
Where he came from, the Ilinra didn't have grand temples or beautiful statues. Ilinra priests were humble-clothed men who traveled the villages making auguries or giving blessings. And while most towns had Ilinra fraternities, Maron had been too young to join their clandestine meetings. Yet he had come this far. Surely the Ilinra here gave auguries like the priests did in the villages. The entry chamber was dark, lit only by strange lanterns that were covered in dark blue glass encasings. The flames flickered as things distant, their light frail. Several figures in dark gray or perhaps dark blue robes stood in conference at one side of the room. As soon as they noticed Marin and Renarin, however, one of the men scuttled forward with a quick step. "'My lords!' he said eagerly, his excited voice echoing strangely in the gloomy room. "'Welcome! Welcome! I am called Camp. Have you come for blessing, wisdom, or augury?' "'Augury,' Marin said. "'Ah, excellent, my lords,' the man said with a friendly bow. He took special note of Marin's blade, then squinted at Renarin's face and paled slightly. "'Why, Lord Colin! he exclaimed. "'This is a rare honor. "'It is a rare time,' Renarin replied with a frown. "'What kind of augury do you require, my lords?' the man asked. "'Of the sands, of the wines, or of the warts?' Marin only recognized one. "'Warts,' he replied. "'Very good.' Please, if you will, there is an augury room to your right. I shall fetch you a seer. Camp nodded toward a small chamber at the side of the entryway, then scuttled away and disappeared into a darkened corridor. Bit cheery for an evil cultist, Renarin noted, frown still in place. Marin snorted, leading the way toward the augury chamber. Ilinra is no cult, he snapped. It's just another part of Bornism. Honestly, there's even a herald outside. Renarin didn't respond, instead allowing himself to be led into the side room. It was oblong with a carved double eye on the floor. In the center of the eye, sitting on top of the glyphs Kav and Dal, was a stone table with a bench along one side and a stool on the other. Three of the blue lanterns hung along the sides of the room, and silver glyphs were carved almost ostentatiously along the walls. They were neither as beautiful nor as intricate as the glyphs in the temple, more like background decorations than actual pieces of art. A few minutes later, Camp returned, leading an elderly man by the arm. The old man looked fairly unhappy to need the assistance, and held his head high, an attempt at dignity slightly undermined by his faltering step. As soon as the two reached the stool, the old man swiped at the younger priest's arm. "'I'm quite fine on my own,' he snapped in a grumbling voice, seating himself. Camp didn't let go of the old man's arm until he was completely situated, however, an action that earned him another swipe. The old priest composed himself, gnarled hands resting on the table as he eyed Marin and Renarin in the soft light. "'I don't recognize them,' he said. They're here for an augury, Grandfather, Camp said, voice light-hearted despite the treatment he had received. Noble men. The distinguished man on the left is Lord Renarin Colin, son of our great Lord Dalinar. And unless I guess incorrectly, our other guest is Lord Marin Colin, he who saved the king's life on two different occasions. They are very important men, the old man snorted. What do they want? An augury, Camp reminded gently. The old man closed one eye, leaning forward to examine Marin a little closer. Then he grunted and bent down, teetering precariously for a moment, and hefted a small bag up from underneath the table and placed it on the table. He began working at its knots with two sets of gnarled fingers, a task that took him no small amount of effort. However, he swatted Camp's hands away every time the younger man reached to help. "'Grandfather is one of our finest seers,' Camp said as the old man finally pulled free the knot and began removing a set of worn wooden discs, the width of a man's fist. "'They say that wisdom and age brings great power in seership, and that a man who—' "'Shut up!' 
the old man snapped. He eyed Marin and Renarin again. Who's paying? Marin paused. I will, holy one. Uh, how much is the usual donation? It's not a donation, it's a payment, the old man said. And it's fifty ishmarks. Renarin snorted at the extravagant price, but Marin removed a sapphire of the appropriate value and set it on the table. Sight of the large gem finally made the old man perk up, and he shook himself slightly, adopting a more formal air. His fingers moved with a bit more dexterity, bespeaking a familiarity as Camp handed him a large sheet of paper, which the old man proceeded to put down over the table's top. Marin frowned, sitting back as the man flattened the large sheet, then set five candles at the table corners. This part was unfamiliar to Marin. The other seers had only drawn the discs from a bag, using the symbols on them to make predictions. Once the paper was flat, the old man arranged the wooden discs into several piles, all face down, their glyphs hidden. Your name? the old man asked. Marin, Marin said. Marin Colin. The man reached into his bag again, riffling through a group of stones inscribed with glyphs. He selected one, the one inscribed with Riem, the basis for Marin's name, then set it at the very center of the table. Day of birth, the old man demanded, distractedly pulling out a piece of black charcoal and scribbling a few numbers beside the stone at the center. Tenth day of Marnol, Marin said. The old man paused. A portentous day indeed, he said. He looked back at the paper, holding his charcoal and frowning slightly. Marin, he mumbled. Riem, is there Roche ish? Seventy seven, Camp said helpfully. The old man hissed, swatting at the younger priest with a twisted hand. Then he proceeded to scribble the number beside the others. All forces, no essences. Another portent. You are a strange child indeed. Marin blushed slightly, beginning to feel embarrassed. This wasn't what he had expected at all. He glanced at Renarin, expecting to be confronted with skeptical eyes. The younger Colin, however, sat with an interested posture, watching the old man's markings with unblinking eyes. Numbers! Marin realized. Should have known those would interest him. And so, the old man said, studying Marin. Why do you seek an augury, Marin Colin, he who was birthed on a tenth day and named after the forces? We seek news of a friend, Marin answered. A friend we fear lost. This friend's name? Arador, Marin said. Arador Colin. Ah... The old man said, exhaling slowly. Should have guessed that one, eh? Very well. He reached into his sack again, pulling free a stone inscribed with the glyph Shal, and set it on the table. Would you know his date of birth? The thirty-ninth of Marshin, Renarin said. The old man nodded, scribbling numbers around Arador's stone as well. Once finished, he reached into his bag one last time and picked out a larger, perfectly round stone with no markings on it. The others had been of some kind of granite, but this was a pure black, probably onyx. It is in order, the old man finally said, holding the onyx sphere in his left hand. You may begin turning over the chips, one from each of the five piles. Marin nodded, reaching forward and turning over the first wooden disc. This was more what he had expected. Ah, the old man said. Hor, time and age. What is the next disc? Shall? I see. Pause for a moment. Marin frowned, waiting as the man scribbled more on the tabletop, forming a cascading sequence of numbers from one stone to the other. Not good. Not good, he mumbled. I see danger. Danger indeed for the air, Colin. Yes, danger and fighting. The next chip. It was Riem, the symbol of unchangingness. This set the old man into a flurry of scribbling and mumbling. Danger? Marin asked with a frown. 
That's it? Of course there's danger. He rides to war. Patience, the old man snapped, idly rolling the onyx sphere in his left hand. You have to give the numbers time. Marin sat back with a huff. Renarin, however, continued to lean forward. He stood slightly, bending over the table and watching the old seer's work. The old man eyed Renarin with annoyance. Next disc, he said testily. Jez, Marin said, after turning it over. Hmm, the old man said, scribbling. I see a difficult passage of time for House Colin. I see divisions and storms and— And would you sit back down? Renarin didn't respond. He stood with his face pressed nearly to the table, eyes scrambling across the old man's numeric equations. This is wrong, Renarin whispered. You leave holes, such big holes, and you wander like a man lost, or one who cannot see. Cannot see? the old man demanded, swatting ineffectually at Renarin. I've been a seer for six decades. Numerology takes time, practice, and age. What do you know of it? Renarin ignored him. But I can't see either, he said. You write the questions even more crudely than I, and you have no answers. You— He trailed off, glancing upward toward the old man's left hand, and the sphere clutched therein. Both hands moved at once. Renarin, however, was far more spry. Moving with a dexterity Marin would have envied in the dueling ring, Renarin snatched the onyx sphere from the old man's hand. This is insufferable, the old man said, swatting Renarin repeatedly with the empty sack. Renarin took the opportunity to grab the man's discarded charcoal stick. The old seer hissed indignantly and stood. My pride is offended. You tempt both winds and even the Almighty's heralds themselves. May the answerer himself bring you ruin. He ignored his grandson's pleas, waving the young man away and beginning to hobble away from the table. He paused, however, then turned back and grabbed Marin's sapphire. Then he huffed one last time and lurched his way from the room. Camp followed with a worried look, shooting a bow back at Marin and Renarin before disappearing after the old man. Well, that was brilliant, Marin snapped. It would help sometimes, Renarin, if you would try to be a little less strange. You even scared away an Alinra priest. Hush, Renarin said, eyes still on the table. He began to scribble on the paper, sweeping the wooden ships out of his way with a dismissive gesture. The discs flew from the table, knocking a candle to the floor and spraying wax across the dark blue stone. Renarin? Marin asked, standing and frowning slightly at the intensity in his friend's eyes. Renarin ignored him, scribbling a few more numbers. He paused, looking down at the onyx in his hand, eyes awed. Then he turned back to the numbers. By the winds, Renarin whispered, almost as if in a trance. He's going to die, Marin. Arador, he's going to die. What? Marin asked. Renarin, you can't know that. I see it, Marin, said the younger Colin. It's here. Finally, I can see. Ardor is going to die fighting the king. Jezenrosh will lose. If only father had stopped him. But Arador went the other way. North, not east. By river, not by land. Renarin paused, then looked up at Marin, eyes mournful. He's doomed. My brother is doomed. Marin shivered. Renarin, and I— He trailed off as a group of priests in blue robes appeared at the door, their expressions agitated. My lords, one of them asserted, perhaps it would be best if you left now. Renarin's head snapped up. Sweat streamed down his brow, and he stared at the men with a disturbing frenzy. He began to shake slightly, like a man about to have a fit. Yes, we should leave, Marin said quickly. So much for the augury, he thought, regarding Renarin with worry. Come on, Renarin. Renarin held up the onyx sphere. How much for the stone? he demanded. My lord? the stocky priest asked. What do you want for it? Renarin asked. What does it cost? My lord, the stone of Asir is— 
The man stopped as Renarn pulled out his cloak pouch and spread its contents across the table. Three ten-set coins glistened beneath the four remaining candles, an array of colors, Rubicon, Hyacinthin, and Azure. That will be enough, the priest said, eyes wide. Enough also to forgive the incident this day, Marin said, pushing Renarin from the room. Lord Renarin has been of a strange temperament recently. The stress of his brother's disappearance has been great. Of course, my lord, the priest said, still staring at the table's riches. Marin led Renarin from the temple, and the bright light seemed to restore a bit of his friend's sanity. Renarin blinked, shading his eyes from the sun, the onyx sphere still clutched in his hand. He stood for a moment, then sighed, looking down. I'm all right, he said, noticing Marin's concerned look. Let's get back to the palace and have something to eat, Marin said. Renarin still looked a bit pale, his skin clammy. Renarin nodded. I feel so strange. That means a lot, coming from you, Marin said, trying a wan levity. Renarin, however, didn't smile. He shook his head. I feel it still, Marin. Arador is going to die. I worry about him too, Marin said. No, Marin, I know he is going to die. Marin eyed his friend, looking for signs of another whatever had happened before. Renarin looked to be his old self, however, though he was even more gloomy than normal. He remained that way through the entire walk back to the palace, though Marin tried to get him to talk about other topics, anything but Arador. It didn't work. And as they walked, Marin found Renarin's thoughts contagious. His uncertainty from before returned, his worries released from their brief captivity. He was no closer to knowing what he should do. He had still abandoned Arador, and he had still broken with duty by not telling Lord Dalinar what he knew. At their rooms again, Marin ordered them a simple meal, hoping the sustenance would do Renarin some good. The boy quickly found his balcony, however, and stood upon it brooding. Marin felt little better. I need to make a decision one way or the other, he realized. It's the indecision that is destroying me. He felt like Arador had looked that week before making the decision to leave. But what decision to make? What if there's another answer? Renarin, he said, standing. What was that you said about Arador before? Going north, not east? When he left, Renarin said idly, Arador said no horse would catch him, even though he knew that father had taken all of the fastest horses with him for the messengers to use. Arador shouldn't have been able to stay ahead, not when father had all the best stock, yet he did. Father never found him. That's because Arador didn't take a path anyone expected. He went north, then took the river east. But the river doesn't flow strongly enough to carry traffic in the summer, Marin said. Renarin shook his head. I saw it, Marin. That's what he did. I don't know how, but he did it. Marin opened his mouth to object, but paused. Long ago, just after Marin had been given his shard blade, Arador had told him something about Renarin. He notices things, Marin, things regular people just don't see. I've rarely known him to be wrong. We need to go after him, Renarin, Marin announced. Renarin looked up. We can't, he said. My father. We have no choice, Marin said. Look at us. We can't stay here, worrying like this. He's your brother and my friend. We can't let him die alone. Renarin stood quietly. We won't fight, though, Marin explained, stepping closer and speaking quietly. We'll leave in secret, like Arador, and follow him. Then, when we get there, we'll convince him to come back. We won't disobey Lord Dalinor's command, but we also won't break Arador's trust. We won't be able to convince him, Renarin said. And besides, my father commanded that no one go to the war at all. We'll be breaking his command if we leave without his permission. We'll break the command, but not the honor of it, Marin said. Renarin, I can't stay here any more. I have to go. This worrying is driving us both mad. It will work out. The Almighty will see to that. Renarin didn't look convinced. Would you rather stay behind? Marin asked. 
Renarin looked up, then shook his head. Let's go then, quickly, before I think about it too much. <laughs>